options for forces in other areas that they think might be hit next as well. And what are some of the likely actions uh, the U.S. could take to retaliate for attacks like these? Well, I mean, there's a whole range of things, anything from, you know, a, a covert means like a, a cyber attack to an overt uh, missile strike within Iran, which would be a big, um, another big escalation in this whole situation. Right. Um, so it, it's up to Trump. Asha, what is the, what traditionally would be the U.S. response to an escalation like this? Because regardless of whether it's a big escalation or a small escalation, it is undoubtedly an escalation. Uh, you know, looking at the commander in chief right now, it looks like his, you know, his decision making is pretty high risk. So I would say there's a higher probability. Um, but then again, we have to take into account that the president uh, doesn't necessarily want to go into another war. We're already in two. Why would you want to be in pursuit of another one? Mm -hmm. You know, we have to end these endless wars. But again, this is a very high risk uh, commander in chief. In terms of decisions you're making, he has been saying that that that's been behind, you know, withdrawing the troops from Syria, for instance. But then, you know, this strike on Soleimani seems to suggest the reverse, because you would not make a strike on Iran's top general without imagining that there would be some sort of retaliation. No. I mean, yeah, and you got to also take into account in terms of did he get kind of uh, hate the lack of term of using lucky or didn't necessarily expect to actually hit. General uh, Suleiman Niso, you know, that that's also the, the big argument there, too, because doing that, you know that that's going to escalate into something bigger. So we will see, though. Mm -hmm. All right. So I also want to bring in Benham Ben Talibu. He joins us on the phone now. Benham is a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Benham, what has been this administration's posture toward Iran in the past? And how have we seen that shifting or evolving? Well, uh, great to be with you. Uh, the, the posture of Iran's proxies in the past, you mean? Or the, yeah, what has been our, how U.S. So strategy operandi, towards Iran, how has that been changing recently? Well, U.S. strategy as of late December has evolved on Iran because one Iran, after six months of escalation this summer, from May until December, had been incrementally ratcheting up the pressure against America, looking to get America to suspend, if not upend entirely, its sanction strategy against Iran. I remember those sanctions were restored because when Donald Trump left the nuclear deal, uh, penalties, financial sanctions, and whatnot that were previously waived uh, returned and, uh, rem and uh, were issued again. Uh, those sanctions were effective in record time, and this whole summer Iran had been looking for a way to break out of the box, hence the, the kidnapping of the tanker, the mining of parts of the Persian Gulf and Strait of Hormuz, um, the downing of the drone, and the escalation built and built and built, so much so that in December they killed an American. It's the first American that died, mm -hmm. um, is part of this max pressure campaign, and the Trump administration seems to have a very high threshold for the use of force. Yeah. Uh, but when finally that... Uh, uh, blood was spilled, the Trump administration responded, and blood begot blood, metal begot metal, and the U.S. responded against an Iran-backed Shia militia for the first time simultaneously on the Iraqi and Syrian side of the border. Mm -hmm. That begot the response by pro-Iran militias and supporters of Iran inside Baghdad, who basically stormed the outer walls of the Iranian, uh, of the U.S. embassy in Baghdad. And then, of course, the administration said it had the intelligence about this impending attack by Soleimani, and through a drone strike took out Iran's uh, most seasoned military general in the past 40 years. Fabulous. Uh, Thank strike. you so much for that yes. fabulous uh, just uh, description and summary of, uh, you know, the, the past few significant months between uh, the U.S. and Iran. I also want to talk for a moment about the fact that Iran was experiencing some pretty severe civil unrest before this attack on Soleimani. Uh, which I suppose was a direct result of the fact that the economy was being squeezed, correct? Uh, or you, you obviously know, know better what, the, what was causing the, the, the protests. Has this given the country sort of a, a pass, as it were, to sort of refocus its citizens' uh, energies? Uh, it may be, but at the same time, of course, um, the Islamic Republic can't prosecute a war if it's bankrupt. Right. Um, and the protests that we saw in mid-November, again, the spark was quite similar to the protests we saw in 2017 and 2018, mm -hmm. where it's an economic grievance by the street against the state. But what sustained the protests uh, in the face of pressure was 
political grievances. Um, as long as there's been an Islamic Republic, there has been protests by the street against the state against the Islamic Republic of Iran. And the more recent protests we've been seeing actually are uh, responded to with much more lethal force from the state against the street. And also they're happening much quicker. There used to be decades between significant protests. Now it's just a matter of months. So the Iranian people feel braver. They're going out into the streets more often than not. But they're being met with much more lethal force. So that is the predicate to this. And the regime is trying to use the Soleimani death as a rally around the flag moment. Time will tell if it works, but I don't think it will work. If this crisis we're seeing now with the missile strikes and Iran's responses does escalate further and there is any kind of strike on Iranian territory, that could be one of the deciding factors to get the population to rally around the government. But anything short of that, I think there will remain a significant cleavage between the state, which is revolutionary, and the society, which is post-revolutionary. Right. And I'm curious what effect, what long-term effect the death of Soleimani will have on that. Matthew, how popular was Soleimani among the sort of younger Iranian generation that appears to be craving more, you know, civil freedoms? Well, and it sounds like some of your guests may be uh, more expert on Iranian uh, domestic politics than me, so I'm happy to defer to them. But, um, you know, I, I think Soleimani was more popular among some, some segments of the population than others, among mm -hmm. uh, the military uh, regime, uh, certainly seen as, as a key figure, mm -hmm. uh, but hated by other parts of, uh, of Iran. You know, there are many uh, parts of Iranian society that didn't want to see uh, the resources going to this overseas empire that he was building, uh, mm -hmm. trying to build in, in Syria, Lebanon, Yemen. Uh, and um, uh, so there, there are many uh, in Iran, younger generation, as you point out, who are much more pro-Western in their orientation, uh, would like to see um, you can't say it publicly, but would like to see a different government in power mm -hmm. uh, that was more responsive to their needs, uh, more respectful of, uh, of human rights and, and uh, basic freedom. So, Benham, tell us who is the backbone or who makes up the bulk of these protesters in Iran? Uh, and are those groups likely to be diehard Soleimani supporters or are they groups for whom the death of Soleimani and the grief will pass more quickly. You mean who would be a natural constituency for yeah, uh, these, to the, be pro Soleimani? No, the, yes, exactly. In terms of the groups that were protesting and that were being fired upon by the Iranian government, those uh, groups, so how did the, they? How are they likely to feel about the death of Soleimani? The, the more popular, more well-known protests in, in modern Iranian history, 1999, 2009, they were almost entirely centered in the capital in Tehran, largely among the middle class as well as the affluent, and then some of the of uh, uh, a little bit more Iranians, a little bit more of a liberal disposition when it did spread elsewhere, as in 2009, 2017, 18, 19. Those protests are actually from the periphery. You can mm. call them blue-collar protesters. Mm. You know, we like to say that those were the, revo the people that the revolution was really made for. Um, they are the part of the downtrodden, the dispossessed, the urban and rural poor classes, uh, somewhat actually more religious classes. And unlike some of the more liberal-minded Iranians uh, in the capital, uh, these uh, individuals on the periphery um, were, were chastising the regime using highly nationalist language, uh -huh. highly nationalist slogans. Basically, uh, what your guest was saying about spending money on foreign wars is absolutely correct. Um, they would mock the regime's foreign adventures. They would mock the fact that Iran is standing with Palestinian terror and rejectionist groups. And those kind of chants continued from 2017 up until uh, uh, present in 2019, I should say, um, because Iran continued to spend money more on those foreign adventures than on building the country up at home. So that now, doesn't that bode well for the Iranian government if you have groups among the more blue-collar, uh, you know, areas and the elitists exactly. who are also... Exactly. Which is why they responded with such lethal force and so quickly, and why they, under the most recent protest, the one that started November 15, 16, and went into December, why there was a sustained Internet blackout. You know, I'm sure you know the phrase, the democracy dies in the darkness. It's this tagline of the Washington Post. Yeah. Um, when you simply look at the lack of reporting that was able to get in and out of Iran because of the media blackout and because of the pulling the plug of the Internet, uh, it's clear that now the Iranian people are the ones who also died in the darkness. And there was a Reuters report recently that said there has been up to 1,500 killed uh, yeah. in that protest, marking it they were the most deadly protest in the modern history of the Islamic Republic. So has the Trump administration inadvertently handed the Iranian regime a sort of gift in disguise? I don't think so. I think much depends on the U.S. response to this. The first thing I just have to say is I, I, I am shocked by the brazenness of this. 
you know, the Islamic Republic may have been betting that the Trump administration won't respond. Uh, that's why they, you know, Iranians usually proliferate weapons throughout the region. They don't tend to fire them from their own territory because that would be more of a dead giveaway. Moreover, this is not like the classic rocket or mortar attack that you read about countless times in 2018 and 2019. This is a ballistic missile barrage. This is a salvo. This is a, a act of warfare. There is a target in mind. There's, there, there's, it's part of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps Aerospace Force. It's part of the formal missile command of the country. This is this had to really go up the chain, um, and it's also highly it's also highly symbolic. But it's not just symbolic. Um, so again, so much depends on the Trump administration's response to this. Again, right. if the response is on Iranian territory on the physical soil, I think you could have a slow rally effect. And it depends again what targets the administration would have. If the response is against Iranian assets in places like Iraq. Or, you know, during the Iran-Iraq war, the U.S. sunk about two-thirds of the Iranian conventional Navy, as well as parts of the IRGC Navy. Um, so that, do you... that may be an option for something offshore, like an oil mm -hmm. installation or an asset that is not on Iranian territory. Right. But again, much depends on the target and the way the administration will choose to respond. So you consider both of these attacks to be stronger than you would have expected from the Iranian regime. And does Quali that qualitatively stronger? And does that then reflect an element of desperation? I I think there's an element of desperation, but also perhaps an element of misreading. Uh, they have more data about Trump's passivity on Iran when it comes to military force than they do about Trump's activeness on Iran. Meaning that they saw the U.S. absorb six months of re of, of retaliation from May to December. And the only time the U.S. used military force, of course, was in December against the contractor and when the U.S. shifted to do a preemptive strike with a drone against Qasem Soleimani. They may have been betting that that's all the U.S. could muster. I think it's highly likely that the U.S. is going to respond kinetically or with military force. Yeah. And that, too, is unclear if it's going to be able to put the Iranians out or to foster a further cycle of escalation. Mm -hmm. um, how much of this is signaling versus how much of this is basically war fighting after two weeks? Uh, is going to be unfolding over the next few hours. Well, it is clear that the Iranian strategy of these sort of petty and escalating aggressions against the U.S. has not been working for it. I think I think it, it had been, but because the U.S. It, it had been, you know, psychologically, they were the Iranians were trying to over the past, you know, six to nine months, uh, solidify the impression that basically it was the opposite of Teddy Roosevelt. You know, that Teddy Roosevelt maxim speak softly and carry, carry a big stick. Mm -hmm. This was the Iranians trying to say that Trump is speaking loudly and carrying no sticks, that he will not enforce these red lines, that the U.S. is a paper tiger, that all they do is sanctions, uh, these kind of arguments that you hear from them. And these are probably the arguments that existed in the halls of power in that country, especially among the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, mm -hmm. and especially among members of the, of the Quds Force, the lower rank and file, of, whose commander of which was killed uh, recently by the drone. Right. So they may have been singing the choruses of, of, of massive escalation. All right. Now, um, joining me on the phone is Jeffrey McCausland. He's a CBS News Radio national security consultant and a retired U.S. Army colonel. Jeffrey, tell us, tell us if you will, how, please put, us in, put it into context for us, how significant these two attacks are. This is a huge escalatory step by the Iranians. They have escalated, first of all, in the use of weapons, the use of ballistic missiles as opposed to shorter-range weapons or mortars and the like. They've escalated in terms of geography. They've launched these weapons clearly from their soil against American targets in, in Iraq. Certainly they've escalated by making a direct attack by Iranian forces, formal forces of the Iran against the United States, the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, have already taken credit for these particular attacks. And last, and certainly not least, once again, they're taking full credit for this, demonstrating not only to the world but to their own population that they're going to make this type of a military attack against a military target in response to the killing of Qasem Soleimani. Uh, and you have been to the al-Assad Air Base multiple times. What role does it play for military forces there? Well, back in the you know, early days when we had huge forces in the, in the region, this was a major base in Anbar province where there was an enormous amount of fighting in places like Fallujah and Ramadi and places like that. 
So Al-Assad was a major base for U.S. aircraft operating in the region, both rotary wing, fixed wing, and drones. It also was a major resupply point for the movement of military hardware, equipment, munitions to support U.S. forces. And after we returned in 2014, I haven't been there since we returned in 2014, my guess is it resumed that same kind of role, probably also providing logistical support not only for U.S. forces but also for Iraqi forces, and may have well been the site where we're also conducting a lot of training of Iraqi forces as we also continue our operations to drive out and destroy the residuals of ISIS still operating in Iraq. Now, we are learning that President Trump and Vice President Pence have been briefed on these attacks. What can you tell us about what might be going on at the White House right now in the Trump administration? What sort of, um, you know, possible responses are being weighed? Well, there's also reports that Secretary of State Pompeo and the SecDef Esper have also gone to the White House. And obviously the president, to some degree, painted himself into a corner by his rhetoric already, by vowing even advance of this in the last couple of days, that any attack on American forces in the region would be considered an attack by Iran and elicit a massive American response. Well, now that attack has occurred and the Iranians are taking clear credit for it, so it's hard for me to believe that the president can ignore that particular response. Mm -hmm. That being said, we now have been once again and continue to be on an escalatory spiral that has been going on for the last couple of weeks, beginning with the killing of that American contractor at a base mm -hmm. in northern Iraq, subsequently followed by U.S. airstrikes, and then subsequently followed by that, by the killing of Qasem Soleimani. The Iranians now have responded to the killing of Soleimani. So now we're into the third, roo third move in this immediate crisis. Mm -hmm. Does the administration want to continue to escalate and move the nation closer to Alva outright overt war with Iran? Or does it want to seek some way to try to de-escalate this crisis and try to bring things back down and hopefully find some effort to move towards a diplomatic political solution? That's the question they're going to be asking each other. And, Jeffrey, it also seems like the, the president is going to have to sort of deal with two conflicting impulses, which is, one, you know, the last thing that he wants or anyone else wants at this point is another Iraq war, right, to see lots of troops being, you know, heading to the, to the Middle East to fight. At the same time, like you said, there is a, a rhetoric that has almost put him in a box and, and sort of made increased aggression inevitable. So how do you balance those two conflicting impulses? Yeah, that's where the president's going to have to try to find a way to thread that needle. And don't forget, this is the guy who ran on a platform of reducing U.S. military presence right. in the region which resonated very largely with his base, number one. Right. And number two, now we see that particular effort expanding. One could also say, however, cynically, at this particular moment, the president might also think that distracting American attention away from an impeachment trial that he's about to undergo in the next few days might be a reason to continue up the escalatory ladder. I certainly hope that is not true, but I'm sure some people will suggest that. But last but not least, many people argue that this is a crisis of the president's creation, beginning with the ending of the Iranian nuclear deal, uh, which uh, had put us in a position where at least their nuclear weapon program was constrained and hopefully would allow us to seek some kind of modus vivendi on other issues. And along the way now, that has moved it from that to this maximum pressure campaign to the series of events you and I are discussing as we've moved slowly but steadily on an ever-increasing escalatory ladder with Iran. Absolutely. All right. So I, I want to bring in now CBSN political contributor Zeke Miller, who is in Washington. Uh, he's a White House reporter for the Associated Press. Zeke, what is the latest you can tell us about what's going on in the White House right now? Uh, we haven't received any new information from the White House since that initial statement from Stephanie Grisham, but we do know that senior administration officials, including the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, arrived in the last few minutes. Um, at the White House, presumably to continue monitoring the situation uh, from here with the president. Uh, we have not uh, heard directly from the president now since uh, in the two plus hours now since uh, since that that, that, that apparent ballistic missile attack. Uh, we, we've heard from the Pentagon, but not yet from the president. And is there any new information about the what is what damage has come out of both of these attacks? I know that we're waiting on that. Reportedly, the assessments are still taking place. Do you know when we're likely to hear more about those assessments? Um, we, we do not uh, just yet know. Um, presumably, that is a part of what is going on in ongoing communications. Mm -hmm. um, there's also uh, uh, waiting to see if that initial round of, uh, of, of missile fire was it. Uh, is there, was there potentially more to come? 
Uh, so it's obviously still dark uh, in that part of the world right now. And uh, uh, certainly by the time the sun rises, we will uh, get, get a greater sense of, of what, in fact, happened overnight there and what's to come afterwards. And, Jeffrey, in terms of assessing the damage of these – oh, I'm sorry, um, Zeke – in terms of assessing the damage, how crucial is that information uh, to determining next steps? Um, that will certainly be uh, be crucial for the, for the U.S. I mean, obviously, the president has sort of said that he – and the U.S. officials said they were always expecting some sort of response from Iran. The question was just how big and how escalatory it would be. Um, that would determine, obviously, the nature of the, the, the then expected U.S. response um, if there were to be a, some sort of second round of, of, of strikes or – uh, if this were to be larger than this or if there were to be some substantial loss of life, uh, it could be you know, significantly escalatory, and you can see a, a greater U.S. response. Of course, the attack on General Soleimani last week was in retaliation for um, the, a number of missile strikes um, at, uh, uh, at U.S. bases, including one that killed an American contractor mm -hmm. uh, a, couple, a week and a half or so ago. So uh, if, there were, if there was to be loss of life here as a result of the strike, you can certainly expect to see something from the president uh, and potentially a, a military response uh, in retaliation from the United States. And, Benham, if you're still with us, uh, obviously, you know, the White House is still trying to assess the damage and then will then come up with some sort of retali retaliatory plan. Um, what would, you know, we know now the president has said crossing a line would be American deaths. So we don't yet know if there were any American deaths as the result of either of these attacks. Um, what would then be an Iranian red line. I mean, obviously, there is going to be some sort of attack, uh, some sort of retaliation um, by the U.S. against Iran. What would be a red line on their side to escalate even further? Well, it depends very much on what is hit by the administration. I think it's highly likely that the Trump administration is going to have some kind of military response. Um, it'd be interesting because the Department of Defense Twitter feed is still saying that they're working out a battle damage assessment. Mm -hmm. um, if there are Iraqis killed because, you know, the U.S., when it's in Iraq, is co-located on, on, on Iraqi bases because it's part of this coalition. So if there are Iraqi casualties only and no American casualties, it'd be, it'd be interesting if the U.S. took that as a step down the mm -hmm. escalatory ladder and did not respond either against Iran on Iranian territory or if they chose to respond restricted its response to Iranian assets and interests outside of the country. Um, I feel like if there is a strike on Iranian territory, then the Iranians would escalate further. There is this Iranian claim, there is this Iranian threat uh, by the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps that if the country housing the entity that launches the attack, uh, if there is a country that houses the entity that launches the attack, uh, is involved, then Iran will retaliate against the interests of that country as well. I just want to point out we're rolling some footage from December of 2018. The president was actually there at the Al-Assad air base. Zeke, what was the significance of a strike there? Does it is it more significant because the president was there not too long ago, I guess last year? It's also one of the biggest U.S. facilities in the region. Um, it, it would, and it, it, it's significant to its involvement uh, in, in the fight against the Islamic State, but also in training and bolstering uh, the Iraqi military. So, uh, to the extent that Iran has been trying to uh, uh, diminish the U.S. troop presence in the region and undercut American influence as part of its uh, broader regional uh, uh, efforts, um, that, that would make it not a surprising target uh, from that standpoint. Uh, but obviously, uh, the symbolic fa factor that uh, the president, that's the base the president visited uh, uh, over Christmas in, in 2018. And also, uh, I was there with Vice President Mike Pence about, you know, six weeks ago, right before Thanksgiving, mm. there and Erbil. Uh, so th these are, these are you know, major U.S. facilities, which is why you see senior officials going there over and over again. Right. And, and why, I guess, when we, we heard from Jeffrey McCausland, uh, he was sort of surprised at the strength of these attacks or sort of the escalation of these attacks. It was more than he'd expected. Benham, are you also surprised? Yes, a, a little bit. You know, the Iranians, again, when uh, when they have launched ballistic missiles during peacetime from their own territory, they've done it against a non-state actor, and they've done it against twice, uh, you know, uh, ISIS in Syria and once against the Kurdish dissident group in northern Iraq. Neither time did they ask the, the national government for permission. Uh, they, they've done it there. But they've never struck another state operating in another state during peacetime. So this would be a fundamentally different shift for them. Moreover, this is ballistic missiles, not rockets or mortars. So there's, 
uh, this is actually a weapon of war. This is a tool designed to, to kill Americans, to send a, a political message, to send a deterrent message that you shouldn't try to respond to Iran's response. Um, and so I think this is the Iranians willing to telegraph that this came from our territory, that we are responding to this development. Right. And part of what may be feeding this desire to publicize is that they think the Trump administration may not escalate or that they think that um, they have something to gain at home, on the, on the home front, um, and, and to further work towards that rally around the flag effect that we talked about. And quickly, Benham, what has Iraq's response been so far? Have we heard anything from the government? I haven't heard anything, but uh, as has often been the case, Iraq is stuck between a rock and a hard place. Yeah. Uh, Iraq is caught between this larger game of competition mm -hmm. uh, for Baghdad's hearts, heads, and minds um, because of um, because of this zero-sum competition between America and Iran. And that does not look like it's going away anytime soon. It's right. going to continue in 2020, regardless of how the administration responds to the strike. And is Iraq likely to respond to Iran if Iraqis are killed? I don't think so. I, yeah. I think they may write that off as collateral damage, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. uh, the Iranians, of course, may say that this is because, you know, you permitted your, your country to be used as a base against us. Uh, but I don't think the Iraqis who are pro-Iran in that country, and that is a lot of the political class, but not all of it, um, would even look to publicize that. Right. Right. All right. I'd also like to bring in Tara Kopp. She is a national military and veterans affairs correspondent at McClatchy. Uh, McClatchy, Tara, thank you so much. On the operations front, what do we know about what has happened so far? So three sites, um, Al-Assad, Erbil, and Taji, uh, have all been targeted. Uh, there are damage assessments being done at all three locations. Um, I think that you, you were just talking about the importance of Al-Assad. Uh, it's very important to underscore uh, how important Erbil is uh, to the U.S. because it's not only where it has been focus of a lot of its northern Iraq uh, Kurdish partner training, but also a major point of supply and communication to U.S. forces that are serving in Syria. So that's, you know, that, that base has dual importance. Um, I think everybody right now is waiting to see what the damage assessment is and to uh, see about casualties. There are some early reports that there have been Iraqi casualties. There's no report so far on U.S. casualties. Mm. But uh, at this, you know, at that point, I think as your um, previous guest was saying, additional American casualties is a real red line for this administration and it could see another escalation. And we don't yet know how uh, Iraqi casualties would factor into that calculation. Um, but looking forward, where does the U.S. response go from here? Obviously, as you said, the assessment is still being made. But once that assessment is made, how quickly is the U.S. likely to respond? Do you think we could see some response tonight? I think that they would uh, be very cautious in a response and a calculated response to Make sure that, uh, you know, it's it's those uncalculated moves that drive everybody into an unintended war. Right. Um, there are all sorts of assets throughout the region uh, between the USS Bataan with its 2200 uh, Marine Expeditionary Unit forces. Uh, there are new B-52s on Diego Garcia that can strike Iran. There are thousands of additional ground forces that have been moved into the region. So there are a lot of options available to the U.S. And... Uh, we, uh, tonight, just as these attacks were happening, our McClatchy paper, the Sacramento Bee, was able to break an exclusive interview with the widow of the U.S. contractor that was killed in Kirkuk on December 27th. And just to remind everyone, it was that U.S. contractor's death and then the injuries to the four U.S. service members that became almost a launching pad, a catalyst. Like, that was a bridge too far that these Iranian proxies had now been targeting and hitting and inciting in injuries on Americans themselves. Um, they have been injuring and killing Iraqis in a lot of these attacks, but that had not driven the type of response that you saw when we did the drone strike on Soleimani. Um, his widow it was a young couple. It was Iraqi Americans. They had both come to the U.S. in 2011, live in a single uh, bedroom apartment in Sacramento, and our uh, Sacramento reporters were able to walk the neighborhood, talk to them, and had this heartbreaking interview with the widow, learning, you know, well, what's next for her? Mm -hmm. And she literally was just saying, do you want to go back to Iraq? And no, it's what is there left for her? Right. 
Oh, that is that is heartbreaking. Oh, thank you so much, Tara Kopp, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. CBS News intelligence and national security reporter Olivia Gazis joins me now on the phone. Hi, Olivia. What is the latest you can tell us? Hi, Tanya. Uh, well, I can tell you that uh, our intelligence agencies have, of course, been track tracking uh, any and all retaliatory options that Iran was expected to pursue, uh, and everybody had been on full alert and prioritizing force protection in the region. Uh, you know, a strike of this sort requires vehicles and personnel to move around and prepare. So it's likely that we had decent visibility into the fact that it was going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm taking a look at an assessment of Iran's military capabilities put out by the Defense Intelligence Agency. And it is worth noting that Iran is known to have the largest and most diverse ballistic missile arsenal in the Middle East. So it has this big inventory of uh, missiles with different ranges, close range, short range, medium range. Uh, and we don't yet know, I don't think, uh, uh, what kinds of missiles were used in this attack. Um, we'll expect to get more details on that later. Uh, it's also worth noting that Iran, um, the, among the menu of options that the Iranians were expected to pursue were these regional attacks on U.S. military and diplomatic interests. So we did uh, anticipate this sort of thing. I think it is notable that these were launched from mainland Iran, mm -hmm. as the Pentagon uh, earlier confirmed. Uh, so we'll see if this is the first step of many retaliatory responses. But it is a notable first step uh, that the Iranians have taken here. Now, it's, it's quite a distance from the al-Assad air base and the Iranian border. Were these missiles not detected prior to impact? I'm not sure that we know exactly that uh, information as yet, Tanya, but some of these missiles that the Iranians are known to have can travel up to uh, 2,000 kilometers. You know, they can make it as far as Israel, of course, and, and southeastern Europe. So it's not, it's not, uh, it's not uh, sort of out of, um, right. the, 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 it's not out of yeah, possibi the range of possibilities that they have right. um, artillery that will make this, um, make it, cover this distance. Okay, Olivia, thank you so much. Please stand by, if you will. I also want to bring in Robbie Grammer. He's a diplomacy and national security reporter at Foreign Policy. So, Robbie, what's been the diplomatic response so far? I mean, I know we're still assessing damage, and there will certainly be a military response forthwith, but what has been the diplomatic response? Hi, Tanya. Thanks. Well, right now, um, obviously, it's still in the in, in the initial aftermath. Um, reportedly, uh, Trump's national security team, including Secretary Pompeo, is meeting at the White House. But earlier today, um, Pompeo spoke to reporters um, and said that the Trump administration was prepared to respond to retaliation in any form from Iran, um, saying in event the Iranians make another bad choice, the president will respond in a way that he did last week, which was decisive, serious, and messaged. Um, and so I think I think what we're going to see right now, um, you know, in, in the immediate aftermath is, is the team coming together um, consulting with allies and having, you know, charting a path forward, um, keeping in mind that a lot of the allies and obviously the government in Iraq are incredibly afraid of, of how this could escalate and potentially stumble into uh, a broader conflict between uh, Tehran and Washington. Yeah, give us a sense of what American allies must be thinking right now in the initial aftermath of this. I mean, we do know that some American allies were withdrawing their uh, troops from Iraq as a result of the attack on General Soleimani. What must they be thinking at this point? Well, the the foreign diplomats that I've been talking to, um, you know, everyone agrees that, that um, you know, Iran is this destabilizing force in the region, but they're, they're really nervous right now. Mm -hmm. um, we saw NATO withdraw that its military training mission in Iraq. We've seen allies like Britain and Canada either prepare to withdraw or move troops. So they're urging restraints on both sides now um, and also reaching out to the Iranians, um, to the Iranian foreign minister, engaging him in, in Brussels to try to find an, an off-ramp to this escalation. And how is Iraq responding? Has there been any response from the government? How is this playing out on Iraqi news stations? 
Well, right right now there there hasn't been. I think it's too soon to tell what the official Iraqi response will be. Um, but from some of the experts and Iraqi officials I've spoken to, this just confirms a lot of their worst fears that Iraq is going to be caught in the crossfire mm-hmm. here of this escalating tension and conflict between the United States and Tehran. Um, I can't directly confirm, but there have been reports um, of Iraqi casualties already in the initial aftermath. Mm -hmm. Though the U.S. is still doing its damage assessments, and there haven't been any reports yet of any casualties of of U.S. service members. Right. And is Iraq likely to respond to these casualties? Who are they likely to blame for them? Uh, you know, it's it's difficult to say. I, I think it's true that, that the U.S.-Iraqi relationship has really deteriorated quickly. Um, since the killing of, of Soleimani, we've seen the Iraqi parliament um, call for the expulsion of U.S. troops and Trump threatening sanctions against Iraq if it does so, which is really unprecedented. Um, and keep in mind, the government, in, amid all these protests, is in a really precarious position with uh, with an acting prime minister. So, so it's in a really difficult position, but I'm not sure it has much leverage uh, to respond either on the Iraqi or on the U.S. side so far. And, you know, I want to bring in um, Benham, uh, Ben Talablu, um once again. Benham, I'm still not clear on what exactly the end game is here for Iran. Well, I think Iran wants to say that they won't take a strike that killed their most important military figure in the past 40 years lying down. And moreover, they don't want to create the impression that Iran absorbs retaliation, much like the U.S. had absorbed a, a fair amount of retaliation and escalation from May to December of 2019. Right, but so that's still a, his- a temporary, you know, positioning, and that's, that's sort of temporary posturing. What is the, their ultimate end goal in terms of their relationship with the U.S.? Well, the, the relationship is to continue to have a war with the U.S. Iran, in many ways, has been on war footing with, with Washington since 1979, since the divorce of two friends during the Cold War period into two now very bitter uh, enemies uh, who are actually now at, at loggerheads physically, it seems like. Um, but the, the assumption that, uh, that, that Iran wanted to send a signal is driven by, the, is driven by something larger. And it's, and it's driven by Iran saying to America, uh, that when you threaten, we'll threaten. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a Persian saying for this, a, a missile against a missile. So Iran is trying to reestablish its own deterrence. You've heard the Trump administration talk about trying to de- deter Iran, trying to limit Iran's freedom of action in the region. This is Iran trying to push back on that and saying, no, we have a free hand in the region. You will not impede our access to the region. And they're choosing a missile, uh, you know, given the capabilities that they have to respond to that. So it's a, a missile for a missile, a threat for a threat. Even in 2012, when there wasn't any of this going on, when we were a year outside of the nuclear year, outside of the interim nuclear deal, Khamenei took to the nation then, and he said a threat against a threat, and that was when Iran launched a couple of foreign uh, t- terrorist campaigns in response to EU oil sanctions. So Iran does respond with a different tool based on a different threat, but it's always trying to equalize, always trying to create the impression that it will not uh, let one linger. But how does that serve it? How does it serve the country? ultimately, uh, economically? Economically, Iran is still playing a medium-term game. He knows that this is an election year for Washington. Uh, you know, you can look at the Dow price right now. Oil prices have spiked just a bit right now. Iran is trying to dislodge the Trump administration. Let's be clear. Uh, maximum pressure was remarkably effective, but in record time on macroeconomic indicators alone, like GDP, oil exports, value of the currency relative to the dollar, on all these things, the U.S. had accomplished uh, economic pain in Iran unilaterally, not even multilaterally. So the whole point of Iran's escalation campaign since May against the drone, against the oil facilities, is to upend this sanction strategy. And the only way it seems like the strategy will be upended is if there's a different occupant in the White House. Right. So the goal is to have this death by a thousand cuts campaign against Washington, where Washington absorbs escalation and retaliation and says that's not worth responding to, that's not worth responding to, looks weak, absorbs it further, and is ultimately voted out. Right. All right. So Hunter Walker joins us now on the phone. He's a White House correspondent for Yahoo News. Hunter, I know that you've been reaching out to the Trump administration. What is the Pentagon saying? Well, right now, we, uh, as of uh, a few minutes ago, we did not have any information about casualties. But mm. they did confirm that more than a dozen ballistic missiles were launched at these two bases in Iraq. Um, they believe they were launched from Iran. 
Interestingly, one of the bases, um, al-Assad, is actually where Donald Trump, uh, President Trump, visited last year. Uh, so that's pretty much everything we're hearing. Um, obviously, it's a pretty fast-moving situation, but they have confirmed there was a strike, and we do not have um, information about casualties. And pretty much all the top officials, the vice president, secretary of state, everybody is convened at the White House right now? Yeah, the press secretary, uh, Stephanie Grisham, told me that the president has been had been briefed. Um, I reached out to her right at the initial reports of the attack. Uh, and she also said that he's monitoring the situation. So, you know, I, I do believe that, um, you know, we also heard from the DOD that they are following this very, very closely, as you would expect. Right. And but no, at this point, no additional information about American casualties and the damage is still being assessed. Is that correct? It, exactly. As of as of uh, about an hour ago, um, that that is, they were saying that they are still getting battle damage reports. Um, I think you know the main question on everybody's mind now is what comes next. I mean, we saw the president in the Oval Office today during his meeting with the Greek Prime Minister, and you know he backed off from this earlier threat he issued this weekend to target Iranian cultural sites because there was a lot of backlash. That's actually against uh, international military law. Right. But he did say that if Iran, you know, does anything to hit. American citizens or American assets uh, that we would respond, you know, he said, quote unquote, very strongly. So I think the big question on everyone's mind tonight, I'm, I'm sure your listeners as well, is sort of when does this chain of retaliation stop and, and does it stop at all? Exactly. Where does it lead? Um, thank you so much. Uh, Benham, I want to bring you in if you're still there. Is there any speculation about the exact type of missile that Iran used? Uh, there is no official report from Iranian uh, sources or from Washington through the DOD or anything else yet. But if past this prologue here, Iran, again, has launched single-stage, solid-fueled, short-range ballistic missiles from its territory into Iraq and Syria in 2017 and 2018. Uh, the entire class of that family is called the Fateh class or the Victory class. It's got four or five different variants. Uh, some of them have a separating warhead. Some of them can carry just under 400, 500 kilos. Um, and they can go up to anywhere from 300 to just under 700 kilometers. Uh, so it much depends on this. These are road mobile missiles. Uh, they're carried towards the border on these things called TELS, transporter erector launchers. Um, so this raises questions of how much did the U.S. see, if anything at all? Was it under the cover of darkness? Was this from a silo or was this from a TEL? Um, and the, the type of missile, again, uh, will, will matter because this will mean for the first time that Iran used a domestically produced uh, system for such a high-risk, high-publicity um, attack. Right. And are we likely to see any response tonight? Is the administration going to sleep on it? We do know that the Secretary of State Pompeo is currently at the White House. But is this... I think, Sorry. Uh, I think I saw an unconfirmed report. I'm still waiting uh, for confirmation. The president may speak. Um, I don't know uh, if, if, if that's going to be confirmed or not. I saw it uh, roaming around somewhere online. Um, it would simply make sense to, to address the nation now, especially if there are no casualties on the American side from any battle damage assessments. Again, we're still publicly waiting for that to, to trickle on down. Um, it, it, if there are American casualties, then, then I think there would be a response in a much shorter time frame. So what would uh, Iran's off-ramp be here if they decide that the increased escalation is not working for them? Uh, how could they pull out of this and save face? I think it's going to be very difficult for the Iranians to save face if the administration responds on Iranian territory. I think if it's on Iranian territory, there's almost certainly going to be some kind of reaction by Iran. If there's a strike in Iraq or in a strike against an Iranian asset elsewhere or offshore, the Iranians could absorb that. Um, the Iranians, of course, may be hoping that there isn't even that and that Washington absorbs uh, this uh, attack against the Ain al-Assad base uh, in western Iraq. Right. And uh, right now, I, I think that we are looking at video. Uh, maybe the producers can clarify. These are missiles from Iranian state TV. So they, have, they were launched from Tehran. Um, of course, we know that this has been reported, you know, all afternoon from Iranian state TV. Benham, do we know what the story is from the Iranian side? How are they spinning this attack? Well, you know, spin is a very interesting word. It gets me into media right now because the former secretary of Iran's Supreme National Security Council, he was the nuclear negotiator at the end of the Ahmadinejad era. 
also someone very hard line, very, very zealous. He tweeted, uh, I believe, a picture of the Iranian flag. Uh, if you remember when uh, Soleimani was struck by the drone, Trump uh, tweeted a picture of the American flag, and several members of the administration or several other official accounts tweeted the American flag. So this is the Iranians, again, trying to play the media game, trying to play the narrative game. They are very cognizant of how this is being framed abroad. They understand that the West is surprised. They understand that this does not fit with the past mold of Iranian responses, of Iran's traditional method of escalation, hiding its hand, proxy warfare. This is very forward. This is very bold. And they're letting this trickle out into their media. Uh, there's even an unconfirmed video that I saw from um, another like military watcher on Twitter um, that uh, had a picture of Soleimani in the booth in the area where the missiles were launched, so clearly symbolizing that this is in response to the killing of Soleimani. So they're spinning this as retaliatory. They're spinning this as defensive. But again, this is one very large, very costly, very dangerous signaling exercise by the Iranians. Absolutely. All right, Venom, um, hang on, if you will, stay with us. I want to bring Olivia Gazis back in. Olivia, Esper Pompeo and O'Brien are all meeting at the White House right now. What do we know? Uh, well, we know that they are in the Situation Room, uh, likely reviewing the intelligence that is coming in and discussing what the U.S. does in response, uh, if anything. Of course, the message from this senior leadership has been that de-escalation is the goal. Uh, the Secretary of Defense saying today that the goal was not to start a war, but warning that the U.S. will finish one if need be. Uh, the president, of course, also said earlier today that uh, the United States was totally prepared to respond to Iraq. But I think it's worth noting that the Iranians fully recognize that they can't compete with the U.S. Uh, as in, in a conventional uh, sort of battle. Uh, and so this is the reason that they have historically prioritized these capabilities that are uh, asymmetrical, whether mm -hmm. that is cyber warfare, whether that is proxy warfare. Uh, and so it may be that they uh, decide that they have exacted enough of a toll here and would stop if the United States stopped, too. That will, right. of course, depend on whether there are any American casualties, which the president has previously said was a red line for the United States. Uh, and he has, of, of course, threatened any number of other measures uh, in the war of words that had mostly ensued uh, immediately following uh, the uh, the strike on Soleimani. Uh, it will uh, be an outgrowth of their conversation today and the, tonight in the Situation Room as to what next steps the United States will take. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Olivia. Let's bring in Dave Sears now. He's a retired, retired Navy SEAL. Dave, what can you tell us about the choice of retaliation on the part of the Iranians? I mean, they could have they could have done a cyber attack. They could have tried to target a, you know, a domestic soft target. Instead, they went for something a little flashy, uh, you know, uh, something that they could show on state TV and something fairly aggressive. What does that tell you? Well, I think, for one, you're, you're right that it is flashy so they can show it on state TV. But I would also caution that we don't know if it's done yet. Right. So I would still say that, you know, Israel could be targeted by Hezbollah, those proxies that Iran has there. Saudi Arabia is certainly a right tar target for um, Iran as well. And you could see some things in Yemen or the Gulf. We don't know where they're going to go. We don't know if they're going to use any of their asymmetric capabilities yet or what that how that plays into it. So hopefully this is the only salvo that they have or two salvos as we're seeing it and that they want to make a very public statement to their people that – we're getting revenge. Right. That's on their side. And they're hoping, you you assume or we assume, that this is where it ends. I think that that's what Iran's hoping. Mm -hmm. I think that that would be a huge miscalculation. The, I just can't see the president after his speech and drawing the red line at you know U.S. casualties or U.S. assets coming under targeting. Well, let's yeah, let's talk about that for a second. All. Do you think that he, it's one thing if there are some U.S. casualties here, but what if it turns out that there are not? That that that'll be interesting on how mm -hmm. he's going to deal with that. I still think you know these are U.S. joint U.S. Iraqi bases, mm -hmm. so there's likely to be equipment, and I think that you are going to see. Um, 
if I had to guess exactly sort of what the president called for, you're going to see a completely disproportionate response from our side. You can't have this, um, you know, one for one type response. Mm -hmm. I think that what he's likely looking at giving them is a very overwhelming response. What would that look that like? Will, that would look like completely wiping out their ability to project power. Mm. That means ballistic missile targets, so they can't launch any more naval targets, um, any possible nuclear targets that they're developing. It could be possible Quds Force locations outside of Iran that are mm -hmm. their asymmetric things that are in Syria. We know their base is there. I think it could be a large array of all of the above. And, and wouldn't you know, that especially result— Especially if there's casualties. Wouldn't that result then in just— more of a military commitment to the region than this administration really wants, has a stomach for? I don't think if you have that, if you actually have that overwhelming response, it it completely eliminates Iran's ability to do anything. Are you talking about sort of I mean, shock we, and we awe? We have that capability. Yeah, no, I mean, you could, we could degrade their capability to the point that they have none. It. It's not – Iran isn't like the United States. It's right. not that big. It's not Russia or China. So you could conceivably target all their capability to do things and if just, you really wanted to. So, And that would be without and, a regime change, just leaving the government there and just – but just wiping out their military. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then saying, okay, we'll leave it to the people. What do you want to do? And right. I think you would have another effect as well if you stick to military targets – um, especially as they are in Iran, you can really, really limit any civilian casualties on the populace. And remember, the um, the people aren't super happy with the regime in Iran right now. No, there have been now, a lot of protests, yeah. There's, there's a lot of protests. Mm -hmm. And so which way do they go on this? If they see – now, one of the reasons that they – have such a problem with the regime or doing anything about it is, you know, for example, the last protests, I think there were reports of, you know, up to 1,500 Iranian civilians killed, another mm -hmm. 2,000 imprisoned. They can't do anything. But if you take out some of this infrastructure that is, you know, Iran's domestic infrastructure as well, the people may see an opportunity to rise up. I don't know that that would happen, mm -hmm. uh, but the opportunity may be there. Or Iran will have to rebuild so much um, that they just will not be able to project any power around the globe at all. Wow, I mean, well, that, that is conceivable. Well, Dave, that's a pretty dramatic uh, picture that you've painted for us. Hunter, what do you think of the likelihood of that, of the U.S. responding to the point where it just wipes out the military? Not a regime change, but just gets rid of the military. I mean, I, I think there's two different um, things that we have to look at right now. Um, what is the likelihood that the U.S. would respond and what would happen afterwards? Um, and I think the likelihood that we will respond is very high. As we were saying earlier, uh, President Trump said we would respond, quote unquote, very strongly if any American assets or Americans were targeted. Um, you know, so and everyone I've talked to, including sources close to the president, you know, right after the Soleimani killing, um, were very clear that this was likely going to um, lead to escalation. I mean, one person said to me, there's a source close to the president. You know, they attacked us, referring to the protests at the Baghdad embassy. We attacked them. They're going to have to respond now. Quote, we are on this path. Um, but the other question is what you were posing before, you know, what would happen and what is this likelihood and that your prior guest was saying that we would totally wipe out their military and that their people would be sort of rejoicing the, the American liberators in the street. And, and I have to say, with all due respect, you know, I remember 2003 when people were making very, very similar arguments about Iraq and Afghanistan, which were much smaller countries with, uh, you know, smaller military capabilities. And I think, you know, if we look at the lessons of history, you know, we are right now playing with a situation that is very similar to the other conflicts we've gotten in the Mideast, and they have not been remotely as easy to extricate ourselves from or end as a lot of um, people predicted at the outset. So I definitely don't want to be someone predicting that this, you know, is guaranteed to be some kind of tremendous success for us. This is, you know, even the people in the White House are aware this is a very dangerous situation. Right. I mean, wiping out the military complex would have repercussions far beyond 
just, uh, you know, just getting rid of their weapons. It would have, you know, economic repercussions. It would have all kinds of um, infrastructure repercussions. And then we'd sort of be on the hook for, well, what's going to happen to these people, right? And then let's look at what happened in Iraq, right? We, we did essentially affect regime change there. But, you know, a lot of the leadership of the Ba'ath Party ended up becoming the, you know, the leadership of ISIS. So, you know, there's been this ongoing cycle of conflict in the Mideast for 20-something years now, and, and I, it's hard for me to envision a situation where, you know, this continued escalation in Iran wouldn't just add to that. Okay, so where will it end, then? Where will the U.S. escalation end? Because obviously, if we keep going tit for tat, Iran can't match us. So at some point, we're going to have the final word. I mean, we, we haven't had the final word in the Mideast in, in a long time, but I think, you know, you are right. You know, as I, as I was saying, even sources close to the president kind of expect tit for tat here. You know, one thing that I would note is in, you know, 1988 was really the last time we had this kind of um, direct military com um, confrontation with Iran. It's called Operation Praying Mantis. And that's when we struck in Iranian territorial waters in retaliation for the mining of the Persian Gulf. And obviously we were able to sort of de-escalate the tensions at that time. And, you know, earlier this summer, President Trump had this similar situation where the U.S. drone was struck. You know, he had these red lines in his rhetoric, mm -hmm. but by his own admission, he didn't want to do a disproportionate response, and he was able to sort of de-escalate then. So, you know, potentially we could de-escalate now, but um, if we do get into this continued tit-for-tat that seems to be beginning, it's, it's really hard to predict where it ends. I mean, for the Iranian regime, the importance here was to save face, right, to, to look as if they got they struck back and they struck back hard because from, you're, you know, you're sitting at home in, in Iran watching state TV. It looks it looks like a big deal right on your television set. So could this be, you know, the end of it? Are there sober enough? minds in Washington that could say, look, we don't like it, but if no, if there are no American casualties, uh, maybe we let it end here. Is that possible? Yeah, I think one big question that I have is, is there any deconfliction channel um, between the U.S. and Iran now? Mm -hmm. You know, there have been some reports that um, Oman and Qatar have tried to sort of act as a go-between. It's not really clear how effective that was. Mm -hmm. um, I think one thing, and I'm sure you've brought this up earlier, but I think one thing that's super important for viewers to understand is just how major of a figure Qasem Soleimani was uh, to the Iranian people. Right. Uh, one source close to the president, you know, framed it as, you know, being equivalent to if the Iranians had killed Norman Schwarzkopf, um, the, the U.S. general from the first Gulf War. But I, I think it even goes beyond that. A lot of the people that I'm talking to say that, you know, with his stature in the society, it was almost like, you know, somewhere between Secretary of Defense, the Vice President, and Secretary of State all rolled into right. one. Well, so there definitely is an element of faith saving for the Iranians here. And on Farce TV, one of the state TV networks, they are framing this attack as quote unquote revenge. Right. And, and I would say that that's the regime's perspective. But as Dave and I were discussing earlier and Benham and I were discussing earlier, there have been, you know, many elements within Iran that are unhappy with the regime. Uh, you know, some younger people looking for some more civil freedoms, other even, as Benham was explaining, even sort of blue collar areas uh, of Iran have now joined these protests, uh, which were largely about a year ago or two years ago, more of the elites, you know, protesting. And so I'm just curious how much of that status that you afford to Soleimani really was universal in Iran. Yeah, I, I, I would not purport to be an expert on that at all. I mean, I think obviously we saw the um, Green Revolution in Iran right at the turn of the last decade. There, there definitely is op uh, opposition to the regime there, which is, you know, which has been pretty brutal to its own people and pretty repressive. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it, it's just I think I think as we learned with some of the American adventurism that we saw in Iraq and Afghanistan around the beginning of the century, um, it, it, it's just really hard to predict where this stuff goes. I, yeah. I should say I have a little bit of um, breaking news coming in on my phone right now. Um, the White House press secretary, Stephanie Grisham, just told me the president is not planning to speak tonight. Uh, so it, it does not sound like we are going to hear from President Trump, um, at least on, on television. Or, okay. or this evening. All right. Interesting. Uh, Dave, I want to get your perspective on, um, you know, these 
groups that you said were that we we discussed earlier that were unhappy with the Iranian regime. I mean, on the one hand, has that sort of dissatisfaction or that division in Iranian society. It's a beautiful to look ahead to tomorrow, guys. I can talk about it. Has that sort of gone away now with this unified mourning over this beloved general? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, how much does we know, you know, speaking generally, that wars tend to unify countries and overcome some of their internal domestic happiness. I mean, often countries in the past have used wars to get over domestic problems. Right. So how much did, you know, Soleimani was not beloved by all. Right. You know, he was a large figure that came from, you know, grew up in the, you know, just post-revolution, the Iran-Iraq wars, really where he came to sort of become, begin to come to prominence. You know, he was injured there and then began working his way up. He's not an original, real original big player in the revolution, and but he does continue on from the Iran-Iraq war. So people were divided, especially because of his um, role in coming in to squash the student protests. Mm -hmm. So he did play a big role right. in that, and people knew that. And the understanding, I mean, I, you know, with all due respect to Hunter, I would never um, – compare Soleimani to Norman Schwarzkopf. It's just not a comparison that's there. The the atrocities that he committed throughout his career and how he's done things are pretty well documented. And the way that it works, you know, we can't mirror image our politics with Iran. Iran is a very factional political system. And you have Soleimani, the IRGC, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, right? Mm -hmm. That is not the only armor. They're the guardians of the revolution. Mm -hmm. So Iran also has an army and a Iranian navy. Then they have what's called the IRGC, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, that's there to guard the revolution. Interesting. Within that segment, you have the IRGC Quds Force, and Quds in a uh, in Farsi, is Jerusalem. That's what Soleimani was in charge of. Mm -hmm. And that their job is to export the revolution. That's why he's primarily external and does things in Syria, Yemen, Thailand, tries to coordinate assassinations in Washington, D.C. The His role is external in stirring all up. And ultimately, just as the name Quds implies, is to take over Jerusalem, take right. it back. And so now... That formal structure looks one way, but the real structure is he did report to, the Quds Force did report directly to the Supreme Leader. So they were very close and very trusted agents of each other, and he had an outdue amount of influence. Now, that also leads to jealousies and things like that within the regular Iranian army of the IRGC sure. and of the Quds Force and his power. So there's a lot of factional politics at play in Iran all the time. The IRGC as well, with parts of the Quds Force, controls large, large pieces of the economy. I mean, they have taken over huge amounts of the economy. So the people look and see them as part of the economic engine, part of the piece that's holding them back. Mm -hmm. And they watch Soleimani spend all this money in Syria, in Yemen, uh, on Hezbollah, in Lebanon, mm -hmm. and they're in economic straits, and they're going, what are we doing? And what? that's where a lot of these protests started coming from. Right. So and how much is this galvanized? I'm not... It's so talking. interesting because the, that is exactly, you know, the sort of the portion of the population that the revolution was supposed to serve were sort of the, the poor, disenfranchised areas, and now they're, they're the ones who are, you know, like you said, watching that spending and and feeling infuriated by it. That's right. But you can, you know, the people see where it's going because it's informative for anybody who's, you know, watching or listening or whatever to take the time and read the Iranian Constitution. This tells you what Iran is about mm -hmm. and the goals of the country. And one of those enduring goals is to export the revolution. And right. in order to do that, you know, you're going to constantly be 
doing things in the region, constantly involved with Lebanon, constantly involved with Hezbollah. So you're right. I mean, one of the biggest problems with revolutionaries is when they win, they have to govern. And all of a sudden, yeah. they're like, uh, How can we remain oh, as man. revolutionaries when we're now the establishment, right? Um, Way easier. You can go to you know Venezuela and see the same thing. Exactly. Uh -oh. Exactly. All right. Well, Dave, I want to bring in Olivia Gazas now, because, Olivia, I understand you have some new information for us about what's going on at the White House. Uh, well, mainly, Tanya, I just wanted to send a reminder that, you know, once these once these uh, conversations end tonight, they're going to have to make a decision about what happens with these all-hands congressional briefings that are expected to take place tomorrow. Uh, of course, the entire House and the entire Senate is expecting to hear from the defense secretary, the secretary of state, the director of the CIA, and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, it's unclear if they will have their hands tied, but Congress has been pretty vehemently, at least Democrats, uh, demanding some answers and demanding some transparency into uh, the series of decisions and the intelligence underlying uh, the strike on Soleimani to begin with. Uh, there have been some calls by Democrats to declassify the notification that the president sent to Congress about the strike, uh, essentially saying that the public has a right to transparency um, uh, for, into that decision and uh, to get some answers as to what the strategy is from here. To answer the question of why now, why now did we act on Soleimani, uh, if, if in fact these were extraordinary circumstances and an attack was imminent, what were they? Mm -hmm. uh, and then to say, you know, how do you get on the off-ramp here? Uh, of course, we heard that the Secretary of Defense uh, indicating today that the, the exquisite intelligence, that very sort of valuable intelligence that, um, you know, cannot be shared with the entirety of the Congress was only shared uh, with the Gang of Eight, which received a briefing today. Uh, we know that there were some senior administration officials letting the uh, congressional leadership and the heads of the respective intelligence committees know what they knew about um, the impending strike, strike uh, attack that Soleimani was apparently planning. And likely they discussed uh, any intelligence about uh, what was might have been forthcoming from Iran in the coming days. Uh, it's not clear whether they had perfect visibility into what is happening tonight. But I would uh, suspect that given uh, how much would have to have been put into place in order for Iran to carry out an attack like this, uh, they would have been sharing that intelligence with, again, that congressional leadership and intelligence committee leadership today. And so we can assume then that tomorrow uh, lawmakers will also get a briefing on the very latest damage assessment, correct? Uh, that is uh, the expectation. I don't know that those plans have been upended yet. Of course, if there is uh, a need for the Secretary of Defense to be at the Pentagon and the director of the CIA to be at Langley, they're likely not going to take the time to come to Congress. Uh, however, lawmakers, you know, are, have been, as I, said, as I said, pretty adamant that they need answers. Uh, of course, if it is a national security emergency and there are American lives at risk, that's going to uh, take a front seat to any congressional briefings. Uh, but I am sure that those, especially in the aftermath of, of this attack, those calls by congressional uh, leadership to uh, have the administration explain its decision-making and its strategy from here are only going to intensify. All right, Olivia Gazas, thank you so much for that update. And we're going to bring in now CBS News foreign correspondent Ian Lee. Uh, Ian, rockets were launched near the U.S. consulate in Erbil, very close to where you are. What's the latest on the ground there? Well, Tanya, it's a really fluid situation right now. People are just waiting to see oh, if there's going to be another barrage of rockets. I think you know, those two rockets, uh, we heard them actually a little after one in the morning here, local time. Uh, we heard two loud explosions. Uh, those were just north of the consulate. Uh, what we're hearing, though, is there no casualties have been reported and far north of the consulate, not, not in the general vicinity. Our, our team went out there to check the consulate and it was fairly calm around there, uh, no sense of emergency. So it seems like those uh, missiles landed quite far north of the consulate, north of the American military presence here in Erbil. Uh, but the, the question now is, are there going to be more? Mm -hmm. And that, that's something that they're going to be watching closely tonight. Is there more going to be incoming? Uh, and, and then how is the United States government going to respond to that? And I can tell you uh, also tonight we heard helicopters uh, flying over Beale too. So again, a very tense evening here. And Ian, the airbase that was targeted was a coalition base. There weren't only U.S. troops there.
Do we know how others are responding? Well, right now, I, it, it really is just wait and see what's going to happen. We're expecting the president to, to talk uh, potentially late, a little later to kind of give us an update what's going on. Uh, but right now, you know, what we're hearing about, at least from that base, they're assessing the damage, assessing what happened. We haven't heard of any casualties at the Al Assad Air Base, which is uh, west of Baghdad, about 100 miles. But uh, you said it is a coalition air base. Uh, we are hearing reports that, uh, you know, before this happened, that uh, other members of the coalition party were thinking, you know, figuring out ways to leave Iraq after the Iraqi parliament said that they want all foreign troops out of the country. But one thing also we're going to be watching this evening is we're hearing the IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps of Iran, threatening regional allies that if somehow they're mixed up in all this, that Iran is saying that they're willing to, to target them as well. So uh, a, a lot of countries in this region, a lot of them are on edge tonight, just watching these latest developments. All right, Ian Lee in Erbil, Iraq, thank you so much for that. David Martin joins me now from the Pentagon. He is a CBS News senior national security correspondent. David, what's the very latest on this fluid situation? Well, the uh, latest is that the attacks occurred, more than a dozen uh, ballistic missiles, and uh, now the U.S. is, uh, quote unquote, evaluating what its response will be. But uh, the U.S. has been warning for days now that uh, Iran would be held responsible for any attack against American interests. And here you have an attack launched directly from Iranian territory on two bases where American troops are located. So I don't think there's any doubt that this attack crosses a red line and will draw a retaliatory strike. And the question really is, is <clears throat> the retaliatory strike going to be limited in scope to uh, just the missile base, for instance, which fired these missiles? Or is it going to be a, a much broader uh, uh, attack which uh, goes after uh, headquarters of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, for instance, uh, since that is the, uh, the military unit that uh, launched these strikes. All that is uh, still in play right now, as is uh, any assessment of how much damage was done to these bases uh, by these missiles. Uh, the, the Pentagon is saying very little about that for the simple reason that it doesn't want Iran to know uh, whether their attack met with any success. So the fact that the Pentagon is saying it is still evaluating uh, battle damage is really just a placeholder on uh, what really happened. So you're saying that at this point the Pentagon knows exactly how much damage there was? Well, they certainly have reports of how much damage there was. The, the, one of the first things that would re be reported is uh, the extent of casualties, because, of course, you'd, you'd need uh, medical assistance. And we just haven't heard any reports uh, one way or the other. Now, if there are American casualties, however, that will presumably be reported, correct? Oh, yes. Whenever an American is, uh, an, a member of the American military is killed, it it gets reported. Uh, and I, I'm not uh, suggesting that anybody was killed. And right. our initial reports were that there were no casualties, and you heard Ian say the, uh, the same thing. Um, but I, I'm just saying we have no official word right. from the Pentagon on whether there were casualties. And now that will make a big difference, though, won't it, David, as to what the U.S. response will be, whether or not there are U.S. casualties? Well, I think the red line has been crossed regardless of whether uh, there were American casualties. This was a direct attack on U.S. troops. That's, uh, that's a cause for war. Mm -hmm. uh, so if, if U.S. troops were killed or injured, uh, I think that would increase the, uh, the scope of what the U.S. plans to do in retaliation. But I think the red line has been crossed. All right, David Martin at the Pentagon, thank you. Sure thing. Let's bring in now CBS News White House correspondent Weijia Jang, then CBS News foreign correspondent Holly Williams joins me from Baghdad, and CBS News senior foreign correspondent Elizabeth Palmer 
who is in Tehran. Thanks to both of you for being with us. Holly, let me start with you. What's the latest on the ground there? Uh, so we've had these two attacks uh, that we're aware of, one on Al-Assad Air Base, which is about uh, 100 miles northwest of here, uh, and one on the Erbil uh, Base, which is about 200 miles north of here. They are both clearly very attractive targets for the Iranians. Uh, we've uh, visited the Erbil Base on multiple occasions. Uh, it's very big. A lot of American investment, a lot of American personnel, um, and a lot of U.S. aircraft. So you can see uh, why the Iranians might choose to target it. Uh, remember that U.S. troops uh, here in Iraq that number about 5,000 uh, were already on high alert, and they had paused their operations here uh, against ISIS, fearing some kind of a revenge attack by Iran. And Elizabeth, what more can you tell us about what's happening where you are? Well, for a start, uh, Americans know a lot more about these attacks than the Iranians do. It happened uh, in the middle of the night. It's just after 5 now, and the sun is not up. Uh, people who will have been watching early morning TV will have seen the Revolutionary Guard having posted a statement claiming responsibility for this attack, saying explicitly that it was a reprisal for the killing of uh, uh, Commander Soleimani. Uh, and the guards have also posted video of what they say are the outgoing missiles being fired from Iran. Uh, the missile is a surface-to-surface -surface missile, a well-known uh, weapon in the arsenal. Um, perhaps more concerning, uh, the guards are also saying that if the United States responds to this attack, the guards in turn will retaliate. So they're really making an explicit threat of escalation. And we heard from David a couple of minutes ago that uh, he believes the U.S. will respond. So uh, this is uh, looking like a very dangerous situation that could, in fact, get uh, a lot worse. Absolutely. And Weija, you are there in Washington. Do we have any more information about how the administration might respond to this attack? We know that President Trump has been meeting all night long in the Situation Room with Vice President Mike Pence, Secretary of Defense Mark Esper, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, and his National Security Advisor. Uh, and so far, we have not heard anything from the president online or in person. And CBS News has just learned that he will not be making any sort of formal uh, remarks tonight from here at the White House. But certainly, the question is what their next move will be. And we know that this is something they've already been mapping out, anticipating that Tehran would respond in some sort of way. Uh, today, during a string of rare press conferences, in fact, uh, all three of those uh, people who I just mentioned, aside from Vice President Mike Pence, uh, gave rare press conferences to say that if Iran were to do anything, were to make bad decisions, that this administration would be ready to respond. And I think part of the reason why we are not hearing from the president tonight is because they still have to decide exactly what that looks like and weigh the potential consequences, because Democrats on Capitol Hill are already uh, publicly expressing their concerns that this could only be the beginning, that right. there could be a tit for tat. And, you know, if the U.S. responds, as it promises to do, what will Iran do next? Uh, we know that the vice president has briefed House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, along with Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, and they are publicly uh, speaking out as well, with Pelosi saying that these needless provocations from the administration have to stop because America and the world cannot afford war. And so it's an extremely tense situation here at the White House, uh, with really no answers as the president continues to huddle. But I can tell you, Tanya, that um, in light of these escalating tensions, the U.S. Secret Service has beefed up its presence here mm. at the White House. And, and we, Joe, we know that lawmakers were all set to get a briefing on that original attack against right. General Soleimani, and that was supposed to happen tomorrow. Is this briefing still going to take place as scheduled, and will it now include more information about the damage done by these two attacks and the retaliation planned? 
Well, as far as we know, it is still on a schedule. Just today, uh, the White House briefed the gang of eight of congressional leaders with classified information regarding that Soleimani attack. But certainly, if that happens tomorrow, as it's expected to, there will be brand new questions about what has now developed and what the administration plans to do moving forward. You know, Pelosi is planning to take a vote, was planning, perhaps uh, still is, especially in light of what happened, uh, to take a vote on a resolution to limit President Trump's military actions against Iran. Um, and so these are issues that definitely Democrats will be raising because they are concerned that, number one, it was not worth it to take out Soleimani, given the residual danger that we are already seeing now. And number two, they want to stop uh, potential escalation, because even though the president and, and uh, his cabinet members have said the ball is in Iran's court to de-escalate, um, you know, many critics of the administration are arguing that the U.S. has to de-escalate as well. And so they have to somehow come to a compromise before we frankly do end up uh, in war. All right. Weijia Jang at the White House, thank you. And our thanks to Elizabeth Palmer and Holly Williams as well. We're going to bring back in Hunter Walker. Hunter, you know, we just heard from Weijia about, you know, the huddle that's taking place at the White House and the calculations that are going to be made tonight uh, and the briefing that lawmakers are set to get, uh, you know, from officials about that first strike. Uh, and now there are going to be very different questions regarding that first strike. I mean, I think lawmakers wanted to ask, what was the, what's the plan in place for the response? And now we've seen the response. Um, so a lot is going to be, you know, compiled in tomorrow's briefing. How do you expect Democrats will respond to this? Yeah, well, I, I think it's an issue for <coughs> excuse me, it's an issue for Democrats on the Hill. And we're already seeing our first indications that um, it's an issue for Democrats on the 2020 campaign trail. Uh, Vice President Joe Biden was at a fundraiser tonight, and it was in the suburbs of Philadelphia. And in quarter, according to Julia Taruso, the local pool reporter for the Philly Inquirer, he briefly addressed um, the strikes while, you know, prefacing it by saying he didn't have many details and he only wanted to speak generally. Uh, Joe Biden's comment was that, quote, what's happening in Iraq and Iran today was predictable. Not exactly what's happening, but the chaos that's ensuing. And he blamed Trump for withdrawing from the nuclear deal and also for the uh, um, killing of Soleimani. Mm -hmm. He said of Trump, quote, some of the things he's done and said in the meantime have been close to ludicrous, including threatening to bomb holy sites. And I just pray to God as he goes through what's happening as we speak that he's listening to his military commanders for the first time, because so far that has not been the case. Right. So I think Biden's comments are really indicative of how we're going to see Democrats you know, really criticize President Trump for the escalation here. Well, let's, and I think let's just drill down for a second on that threat by President mm -hmm. Trump that was widely criticized, that threat to attack, uh, you know, national or, you know, um, religious artifacts or, or, or institutions in Iraq. I, I believe the administration has backed down. I think Mark Esper was asked about that at one point, and he said that would constitute a war crime and we don't commit war crimes. And I believe the president may have said something today that indicated he was backing down from that specific threat as well. Uh, is that your understanding? Yeah. So, you know, the, what happened was over the weekend, the president tweeted that, you know, the U.S. had 52 sites in Iran uh, mm -hmm. representing the 52 hostages that were taken at the U.S. embassy during the revolution there, and that these sites, you know, were ready to be targeted um, in the event of any Iranian retaliation. Now, that immediately prompted a bit of a backlash because a lot of people, you know, said that it's against military law to target cultural sites. Right. So the president did back away from that. What he said in the Oval Office today, I have it right in front of me, was, um, we are, this is a quote from President Trump, mm -hmm. we are, according to various laws, supposed to be very careful with their cultural heritage. And you know what? If that is what the law is, I like to obey the law. Right. But think of it. They kill our people, they blow up our people, and then we have to be very gentle with their cultural institutions. I'm okay with it, but he said, if Iran does anything that they shouldn't be doing, they're going to be suffering the consequences and very strongly. Right. That's so what he I'm... did seem to back away from the specific threat to cultural sites, but he certainly didn't back down from, you know, the red line uh, with Iran. No, absolutely. It's sort of a sorry, I'm not sorry kind of response. Um, and in terms of, 
a, a response that the White House might be framing today. We just heard David Martin at the Pentagon saying that he believes that this attack, whether or not American lives were lost, constitutes a crossing of the red line that the White House was talking about. Um, what can we infer from the president's tweets and what he's said about the strength of the retaliation that might follow? Because in some ways, he may have boxed himself into a bit of a corner with some of the language that he's used. Yeah, I think it's really hard to gauge what the president's going to do on this. Um, you know, in Syria, we saw him um, drop the quote-unquote mother of all bombs um, at one point when he was interested in retaliating, but against something ISIS had done. But, you know, as I was discussing earlier, um, there was this incident with the drone strike where Iran shot down one of our drones earlier this summer, and it seemed to violate his red line, but he did back down from that. Mm -hmm. And certainly on the campaign trail in 2016, he kind of indicated he would get us out of what he called, quote unquote, endless wars in the Mideast. Right. But as I was alluding to earlier, I mean, sources close to the president told me right after the killing, um, you know, that they saw Soleimani as, as a very major Iranian military leader. They made the comparison to Schwarzkopf, and they said that put us on the quote unquote path. Uh, and they expected both retaliation from Iran and then a response from Trump. I think the real question that's going to come up with Democrats on the trail and on the Hill as we look Look at potential further escalation here is, you know, what was this supposed intelligence that prompted the strike against Soleimani? Right. Uh, and my colleague Jenna McLaughlin has just published a story saying that um, Saudi officials warned of a cyber attack literally on the day um, of that strike. And that this warning, you know, it didn't definitively accuse Iran, but um, experts believe that Iran was behind that cyber attack. Now, it's not clear that that's what prompted the killing of Soleimani. I, I, I don't think a cyber attack is the kind of imminent threat that um, the president has implied it was. But, you know, when he was speaking in the Oval today, they actually asked the president, you know, what was this intelligence that led you to make the decision to kill Soleimani? And Trump's comment was not an answer. He said, look at what he was planning. Right now, it's classified. Mm -hmm. So I think that's going to be one of the bigger questions that we see emerge this week. What was this intelligence, and yeah. can the White House explain why they took this drastic step? Well, that's what lawmakers are supposed to hear tomorrow. So we'll see. Um, Hunter, thank you so much. Let's bring in now Catherine Herridge. She is the senior investigative correspondent for CBS News. Catherine, how did what we heard from Secretary Esper earlier today set the table for what we're seeing play out. Well, at the news conference at the Pentagon earlier today, Secretary Esper really provided new detail and a lot of granularity about the intelligence that led to the strike last week. He was asked a question on whether this was imminent or an active plot, and he said it would be fair to say it was days, not weeks away, and that he was also very specific about General Soleimani saying, I'm using the language he used, he was in Baghdad to coordinate attacks. So again, that tells you that the administration had assessed based on multiple intelligence streams that this was a plot, as I said today, that was in its final stages. A couple of other points, Tanya, that really stood out from Esper's news conference. He said Iran will retaliate. That was the expectation of the United States. Uh, and the backstory there is that we had reporting from mm -hmm. my colleague David Martin at the Pentagon just about an hour or two before that, that military officials were very concerned by what he, they called as troubling movements of military Iranian assets mm -hmm. in the region. And then also, finally, Secretary Esper offered what appeared to be a very public off-ramp for the Iranians. He said the U.S. was opened to a dialogue and a diplomatic resolution. And I keep coming back to that point because over the weekend, Republican Senator Lindsey Graham told CBS News that he was going to personally urge the president to lay out a roadmap or a pathway to de-escalation. Senator Graham told me that he felt it was important for the president to appear strong, but also, his words, reasonable in the face of what's gone on in Baghdad last week. And, Catherine, are there any reports? Uh, I, I've been reading a few reports. I don't know if they've been confirmed that Iran has said that if there is no retaliation for this attack, that that's it. They're done. 
Well, one of the things that caught my attention this evening was, of course, the timing. I always think it's important to look at the timeline and how these events kind of rack and stack. Mm -hmm. And just about the same time that these missile attacks were launched, we had the statement released by the IRGC, that's the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Council, so the umbrella group that's over the military. And they said that this was in revenge for the assassination of General Soleimani. And I reached someone within the White House who told me that they they were paying attention to the statement because they felt this was very much for domestic consumption mm. in Iran. This was a way to say to their own people, we are punching back against the United States. And they were, my contact was operating off of very preliminary information, but they said they did not believe that this was the grand retaliatory strike that they had been anticipating or likely anticipating from the Iranians in response to the killing of General Soleimani last week. So they didn't get the sense that the Iranians were done? That not earlier today, but again, it's very fluid, so I don't want to go too far and speculate. But when I had my conversation, they said they felt that this was very much for domestic consumption to punch back against the idea that Iran was weak in the face of the United States. Right. And, and you've been in contact with your sources within the administration. Mm -hmm. What is your sense about how quickly they will decide on next steps? Well, I think you just have to look at uh, the TikTok of events this evening, Tanya. You saw uh, the top national security advisors go directly to the White House and to consult with the president. And the White House was very public about saying the president remain engaged this evening, though at this point we are not expecting any statement or address from the president on the uh, incident this evening. I don't want to speculate, but it seems clear from my reporting that they anticipated retaliation by Iran, and it was not necessarily the case that they would, and these are my words, uh, take the bait and engage, especially in light of Secretary Esper's very public comments that they were urging Iran to take the path of de-escalation and the U.S. was open to a dialogue with that country. So it appears then, you know, according to David Martin at the Pentagon, we were talking to him earlier, mm -hmm. that, you know, the, the Iranians did not take that olive branch, as it were, or did not see it as an olive well, branch. Well, certainly it doesn't. It's, pardon me. It certainly doesn't look... It certainly doesn't look that way because when you look at Secretary Esper's comments and then you look at the number of ballistic missiles that the Pentagon says was fired significantly from Iran and not by one of its proxies mm -hmm. or not from Syria, which is about 200 miles away from uh, the primary air base that was uh, attacked. So they really took ownership, not only in the launching of the attack, but then again, this very public statement from the IRGC, Iran's Revolutionary Guards Council. This is the group that's over the military saying it was us. It was in revenge for General Soleimani. So it was a very specific message right. to the United States. But again, I would emphasize um, the importance of the message domestically in that country as well, that they are punching back against the United States in this case. Absolutely. And that they mm -hmm. showed the airstrikes on national TV. It was something that mm -hmm. they could put on the airwaves, mm -hmm. as it were. It seemed um, very choreographed, I would, I would add. Exactly. Now, mm -hmm. did you get the sense that it will be of great significance to the administration whether there were U.S. casualties as a result of these attacks or that the attacks in and of themselves w were sufficient to warrant a response? Again, in these situations, I don't, I don't like to go too far and, mm. and, and speculate about, about what, what I think. I guess the other issue, if I could draw attention to tonight, is um, these classified briefings that they've had on Capitol Hill uh, for the leadership, the, the so-called Gang of Eight. That would be a very highly classified briefing that would get into some of the sources and methods and a lot of granularity mm -hmm. about how we obtain the intelligence, who we got it from, our partners in the region, and what we anticipate as next steps from the Iranian. I mentioned that, the Iranians, I mentioned that because I'm sure you've noted already in your broadcast that the administration was very quick to notify the congressional leadership about the response from Iran this evening. There was no gap between what was happening almost in real time and that notification. And that seemed to be... Um, so paying attention to the complaints of the last few days that they had been left in the dark about what was a clearly a very serious deci decision by the United States to take out this general. Absolutely. All right. Well, mm -hmm. Catherine Herridge, thank you so much. You're welcome. Let's bring in now CBS News intelligence and national security reporter Olivia Gazis once again. So, Olivia, 
Let's look at the bigger picture, if you will. How will these attacks impact the Trump administration's national defense strategy more broadly? And, and I ask that in light of the fact that, you know, there's a tension right now, I think, in the administration between not wanting to enter into any more foreign wars. I mean, nobody has an appetite for that after Iraq. And also, you know, the need to appear strong in the face of Iran's escalating military actions. So where will that balance be struck? Absolutely, Tanya. And that's a very important point and something that, of course, the president ran on was this notion that, you know, rather than being mired in the Middle East in these regional conflicts, we were going to step out of it. And a crucial part of his own administration's national defense strategy, this sort of seminal document that is put out uh, annually that lays out a sort of worldview from the Pentagon uh, on the part of the U.S. military um, outlined this, this sort of necessary pivot to what it refers to as great power competition. You know, this, this notion that, that the U.S. is in a long-term strategic competition between nations like Russia and China, you know, rising powers or at least important powers um, that uh, would need to sort of uh, meet with a U.S. counter ballast uh, as they try to ri rise to economic and military prominence. You know, there's this notion also that uh, the United States would have to pivot away from its efforts at counterterrorism, that it had sort of focused its intelligence and military capabilities on uh, for over a decade. And in order to preserve uh, an international order where the U.S. maintains some kind of dominance, to really invest on maintaining uh, its competitive edge. Uh, you know, one other thing that is a sort of a second or third degree effect, not to diminish the uh, immediacy and the urgency of what's going on with regard to Iran, but one of the um, sort of ancillary effects is the, that that both NATO and the U.S.-led coalition to defeat ISIS have suspended their operations there, uh, raising the very real specter that that group could reconstitute in relatively short order. Military and intelligence officials have warned consistently that its propaganda, ISIS's propaganda machine, is still very much alive. Uh, and it does not take too much of an opportunity, uh, too big a window uh, for them to effectively, you know, regain uh, at least some uh, clout, if not uh, territory. So that is a very important thing also to keep in mind uh, as the administration plots its next steps here. Absolutely. That's certainly a complicating factor. But for all players involved, uh, Benham, Ben Taliblu is also still with us. He is uh, the senior fellow at the Foundation for defense democracies. Benham, if you could weigh in on this question of ISIS, right? Because, uh, you know, ISIS is no friend to Iran, no friend to Iraq, no friend to the U.S., uh, and yet there's tensions among all of these players. So how does that play out? You know, in the short to medium term, if there is a pause, like we've been hearing as reported for the past two days of the counter-ISIS campaign and the counter-ISIS campaign, uh, by Washington, NATO, and uh, the international coalition, that could be a boon to Iran. Remember, when the actual campaign, the, the fighting on the ground by Iraqi security forces and pro-Iran uh, Shia militias, uh, as well as, of course, the U.S. air power above, uh, was going on, Iran used the fight against ISIS to solidify its control. It had uh, basically created the IRGC model uh, in, uh, in, in neighboring Iraq. It had paramilitaries that eventually penetrated the Ministry of Interior, the Ministry of Defense. And so having a radical jihadist Sunni organization in a neighboring country that has invited you in to help fight that organization permits you both to fight that organization to stop the threat to your country, as well as to make gains in the region on behalf of your own cause. So right. Iran did that quite skillfully in 2015 and 2016. You can look at some of the battles. They even had... Um, some Iran-backed forces in 2014 even had U.S. air cover, mm -hmm. very interesting, in smaller towns mm -hmm. uh, in Iraq and places like Jurfok, Fakhar, or Amrali, uh, historic to know where that confluence of America and pro-Iran forces converged to fight ISIS there. Um, but in the long run, of course, to have ISIS take over Iraq totally and win would not be in Iran's interest either. Right. It's not quite the enemy of my enemy is my friend. It's a little more complicated. Exactly. Uh, so, Benham, if, if the U.S. doesn't respond, how would the Iranians see that? I mean, at this point, we can probably all agree that it is likely the U.S. will respond. But if the U.S. decides that this was a pound of flesh for a pound of flesh or what have you, um, 
How would the Iranians interpret that? Well, just, just to be clear and to remind uh, the audience, um, this tweet storm that is now being defined on, the, on this call and on this show as the new U.S. red line has actually been something of a U.S. red line before. Mm. Uh, Brian Hook, the special representative on Iran, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, uh, and also John Bolton, when he was national security advisor, talked about threats to America's interests and security um, for basically a nine, ten month period as uh, being met with overwhelming force. And in each instance, there were threats to America's interest and security in the 2018, early 2019 period. And the U.S. did not respond to overwhelming force. And it really remained the uh, status quo until May 2019 when Iran escalated further. So it, it would not be unprecedented for the U.S. to back down from issuing this red line. In fact, the Trump administration itself has had a tough time sticking to this red line. That's why the events have been moving so quickly since December, because the Iranians did not anticipate this sudden 180 right. in the Trump administration's posture. Right. Um, but if, if the U.S. doesn't do it, it's entirely possible that the Iranians have, would have used this strike, again, it's a low probability chance, but it's, it's possible that they would have used this strike to respond to the uh, killing of Soleimani and then simply sit it out, meaning mm -hmm. if Washington doesn't respond, the Iranians are happy because they feel like they have restored their deterrence, and you go back to a game of escalation, but a much more manageable game of escalation that doesn't look like it's racing towards war right. anytime soon. Right. It's also possible that weakness, as is the classic thing with authoritarian regimes, is provocative. If right. the Iranians see that the Trump administration is afraid, well, maybe they'll make on their threat to respond to uh, a U.S. asset or interest in a different country mm -hmm. and say that Trump will not respond. Or um, perhaps they, they would respond advantage. with a covert attack that is less easily traced directly to Iran. Uh, true, true. They can sneak one in and the U.S. would have to first discover it mm -hmm. and then expose it and then show its chain of attribution. All of this takes time and time permits the opportunity, the mind to cool and de-escalation to set in. Right. But well, would you agree, though, that whether or not the U.S. Uh, retaliates here, that Iran is probably motivated to continue its strategy of aggressions, maybe perhaps smaller aggressions, but... Uh, well, for, for me, for me the, the, the decision point for Iran... <laughs> Uh, in the past year or so was May 2019. Uh, until May 2019, Iran's policy was strategic patience towards America. Mm -hmm. You can wait out the sanctions pressure. May 2019, their policy became graduated escalation. Meet pressure with pressure, ratchet up the pressure, tit for tat over time. Mm -hmm. Unless the U.S. confronts you militarily, don't change the course. Mm -hmm. Now there's the potential for the U.S. to massively confront Iran militarily. If uh, there is a conflict, or if there is a de-escalation by America and Iran senses this is weakness and pounces, then, of course, the policy could become just escalation writ large, where there is no measure or scientific rhyme or reason for why Iran goes from one type of escalation to another. Right now, there's a very clear political rationale. Make it costly for America, make America reconsider the fact that it started this whole conflict, make, uh, make it reconsider... Um, uh, responding uh, to the to, uh, to the terror threats about Soleimani, they can reconsider having left the nuclear deal, um, and so there was a political logic there. Uh, if we get to a point where there is escalation quite quickly by both sides, it could be less measured and less politically motivated, and thus lead to an accidental conflict. Even though both leaders, President Trump in the U.S. and Khamenei in Iran, have said publicly many times that they don't want a big war. And, uh, and so, Ben, if you look at what the Iraqis want out of all of this, what would be the, you know, the ideal resolution or result for, for Iraq? It depends very much on which Iraqi you ask. As, as of October of last year, countless Iraqis, hundreds of thousands, based on if you just look at some of the videos that you've seen, have been protesting against the Iraqi state. Uh, the political class is not representing their views, their wishes, their interests. In addition to corruption, in addition to mismanagement, in addition to resource scarcity, they are blaming the Iraqi government for being reliant on Iran. And uh, the Iraqi government I mean, has not shifted to accommodate this blame. And the, the Iraqi government, the constellation is relatively the same. There probably will be some government change in, in 2020. Um, so it depends which Iraqi you ask. If you, if you ask the pro-Iran groups in the, in the parliament, uh, they would like to use this as a casus belli to evict America from Iraq. They'll say, you guys co-located in our bases. 
uh, you guys in Iran have drama, you guys in Iran have a conflict, kindly leave. Mm-hmm. And then in, in so doing, actualize an Iranian national security goal, which is to evict America from the region. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, ben, um, please stand by, if you will. Let's bring in now Catherine Harridge again. She's the senior investigative correspondent for CBS News. Catherine, uh, what can you tell us about how the Department of Defense is responding? Well, the Department of Defense issued a very public and detailed statement tonight, Tanya. And what caught my attention is the level of detail because it seems to lay the groundwork for future action if that is the course that the administration chooses to take. And it states in part a very specific number about the missiles involved. It says more than a dozen ballistic missiles against U.S. military and coalition forces in Iraq. And then it goes that extra step to say the source of the attack, and it says launched from Iran and targeting at least two Iraqi military bases. And then it continues further on, the United States will take all necessary measures to protect and defend U.S. personnel, partners, and allies in the region. So that's a lot of specificity in a statement that seems to set the table for a future response if that is the decision Mm -hmm. the administration ultimately chooses to take because it puts the ownership and the responsibility of the attack firmly with Iran and not one of its proxies, not one of its militias, Mm -hmm. and not one of its allies in Syria. Now, if we just kind of go back a little bit to the Oval Office spray with the president today, if you look at the language very carefully, he makes a number of points. He justifies the assassination of General Soleimani, saying that he was a horrible terrorist, he was someone who was responsible, kind of pioneered the idea of IED attacks and suicide attacks against our military personnel in Iraq. And just as an anecdote for you and folks at home, one of my contacts was explaining to me that there was a lot of sort of sweet irony in the fact that General Soleimani was killed on that route coming out of Baghdad International Airport called Route Irish, because this is sort of a four-lane highway. It's very broad. But it was really one of the most dangerous stretches of road during the surge in Iraq. And it was a place where many U.S. service personnel uh, lost limbs or were killed because of this strategy that was really pioneered by General Soleimani. Mm. And then also, I just want to again draw attention to the very specific language the president used at that news conference. He says, quote, if Iran does anything that they shouldn't be doing, they're going to be suffering the consequences and very strongly. So a very succinct capsulization, if you will, of what his bottom line is. Mm -hmm. What we don't know tonight, and I don't want to speculate about, Mm -hmm. is whether the firing of more than a dozen ballistic missiles at these two bases that are used by the U.S., Iraqis, and I believe even others, constitutes the crossing of that red line. But we know the president has been meeting with his national security team, so his closest advisors, to make an assessment of what happened this evening and what the follow-on would be for the United States. And in the event that U.S. lives were lost in these attacks, uh, would, would at this point, probably the Pentagon knows this information, I would imagine. I mean, yes, it, I think that's a fair assessment. And I think mm-hmm. that it's, you know, it will be, have to be released eventually. But will the information regarding the damage done by these attacks be further uh, ammunition, as it were, for the Iraqi regime to sort of mm-hmm. gloat to their people? Well, I think you make a very valid observation. Um, Nothing is a secret, you know, in the age that we work in now. Everything is on Twitter or on the web in seconds. So we're going to know pretty quickly as we head into morning light in Iraq the nature and the extent of the damage at these sites because of the Iranian attack. Uh, And we'll also get a much better sense of whether any individuals were injured uh, in a minor way or a more serious way or whether there were any fatalities. We don't have any indication uh, of that this evening. I want to be absolutely clear. But any of those details, of course, go to the broader fabric of what kind of decision the U.S. will take when it decides to respond. Obviously, the more aggravating these factors are, the more it makes the case for response. 
But before the attack this evening, Secretary Esper, again, we talked about this a few minutes ago, but Secretary Esper said the U.S. was open to a dialogue with Iran and de-escalation. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not a word mm -hmm. the Secretary of Defense uses lightly, right? <laughs> so to, to, say, to say the least. And he said the onus was on Iran, which I felt was a very clear way of telegraphing that the United States felt the ball was in Iran's court, to use a cliche, and they were going to be one of the main decision makers over how things would transpire over the next few mm -hmm. days. But one of my contacts who works within the White House cautioned this evening that the Iranians are uh, extremely smart uh, and they're extremely strategic. And they're also extremely patient. You know, mm -hmm. there's a phrase in that part of the world um, that uh, we have watches, but they have time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right? You know, so they're extremely patient. I don't want to make light of that, but they're very smart that way. And my contact sense was that significant retaliation by the Iranians might not come until some future date. It might not be immediate. Mm -hmm. And very interesting. Well, if that mm -hmm. statement by Secretary Esper was meant to be an olive branch of sorts, it was certainly not taken no, as not. that mm -hmm. uh, by the Iranians. It, has mm -hmm. there been any reporting that you're aware of that in those statements, those domestic statements that you referenced earlier mm -hmm. from the Iranian regime mm -hmm. to the people of Iran, uh, you know, discussing the nature of this retaliation? Was there any statement or language in it that indicated that perhaps for the Iranian government this could be the only retaliation necessary? Let me just take a closer look at the language. Uh, again, that statement from the IRGC, which is Iran's Revolutionary Guard mm -hmm. Council, so that's sort of the umbrella group. Uh, that's uh, over the military, says, quote, the brave soldiers of the IRGC's aerospace unit have launched a successful attack with tens of ballistic missiles. Now, that's an inflated number based on what we know from the Pentagon on al-Assad military base in the name of martyr General Qasem Soleimani. So they are elevating mm -hmm. his status and saying very specifically it was in his name and in response to his killing last week by the United States. Couple that with the fact that the Pentagon has publicly said it, these missiles were launched from Iran, again, not from a proxy, not by a militia, not mm -hmm. by the Syrians, but from Iranian territory. That really ups, ups the ante there. Though, in my experience, I worked overseas for a number of years, you have to take these public statements from the Iranians really with um, a, gr a grain of salt in the sense that so much of that is meant also for domestic consumption. Mm -hmm. You know, the kind of we're punching back against um, the United States, which they did this evening. Let's be clear about that. They did punch back in a very um, significant way. What we don't know, and I don't really wish to speculate on, is whether that's going to be enough for the United States to further escalate the tensions in the Gulf. Right. And um, Catherine Herridge, thank you so much for that. I believe we still have uh, Benham and Olivia standing by. Um, Benham, I want to ask you about, you know, what Catherine was referencing earlier the statement from Secretary Esper before these attacks that suggested that, you know, the U.S. was hoping to de-escalate things, that, you know, that they were opening a path uh, to dialogue. How likely would it be that the Iranians would accept that path? You know, the, there are a few times in the history of the Islamic Republic when they've done a 180 on a key national security prerogative. And um, the Iranians can accept dialogue, but the conditions under which they do that is, is, is imperative to note because pressure has to build and build and build and build. And then only when they feel like they've got their back against the wall, if they're offered an off-ramp, then they'll look for it and then they'll take it. And that's mm -hmm. somewhat like how the Iran-Iraq war, which went on for eight years, that's how it was ended. And I liken so much of the max pressure campaign of the Trump administration to a lot of the political and economic and even some of the military conditions that existed during the Iran-Iraq war. That remains in the history of the Islamic Republic, the blueprint for both war making and peace making with the Islamic Republic. And it's important to keep offering Iran publicly a lot of these off-ramps. 
uh, you know, in Washington, it may not be fashionable to look at the way the president has been tweeting about Iran, not, you know, recently, but in 2018 when the sanctions were being restored, because as he was restoring sanctions, he kept saying, I'd like to meet Rouhani, I'd like to meet Rouhani. And while there was criticism from the president's right flank inside the country, inside Iran, that was seen as a positive, because the Iranian people were able to then chastise their own leaders and say, look, you're not even doing what North Korea did. You're not even sitting down. Uh, with Washington. Why are you so ideological? Why are you so opposed? Why do you, are you doing things to cause more pain for us? And that created a domestic source of pressure on the regime, and that was a boon to the administration's maximum pressure policy. Um, so again, Iran negotiates very rarely, earnestly, uh, but only under conditions of, of massive pressure. Mm -hmm. And now Iran is feeling ascendant. It is, it is feeling like it got a major lick in against the United States. Uh, it did cross the red line, as the president said on Twitter. Uh, it did have a summer of escalation uh, against U.S. interests and assets mm -hmm. and allied interests and assets and security in the Persian Gulf. <clears throat> but they haven't taken the off-ramp yet. Mm -hmm. One wonders if they are going to feel empowered if the U.S. doesn't respond or if they are going to feel um, like they've gotten the message in and they will, they're willing to absorb the rest of America's escalation, which could be sanctions, it could be covert, it could be cyber, it could be psychological warfare. Uh, who knows? But, but that kind of language where the Secretary of Defense tells me that it's not the U.S. that's looking to rush to war. The U.S. is still being very, very, very judicious here. All right. Um, Benham, thank you so much for that. We have team coverage here. Let's bring in CBS's Natalie Brand, CBS News senior intelligence correspondent Catherine Herridge, and CBS News foreign correspondent Ian Lee. He is in Iraq. So, Ian, let me start with you. You are on the ground there. Can you tell us what's the latest? What time is it there, first of all? Well, right now it's uh, just getting to be about 5.30 in the morning. Uh, this attack happened uh, about four hours ago. We heard it with the two explosion, he, explosions here in our bill. Uh, after that, we also heard uh, helicopters in the sky. And just a little while ago, we also heard a fighter jet uh, overhead. Uh, so it's still fairly tense here. Now, we understand that these two missiles landed north of the U.S. consulate, away from the U.S. military presence here. We haven't heard of any casualties. Uh, we had a team that went by the consulate to see if, the, if there was any action there. It seemed fairly calm from uh, what we could see. So right now, there's just a lot of anticipation of, is this over mm -hmm. or is there going to be another round that's going to be incoming? You know, right now, really no one knows. Had security there been beefed up? Were, were these attacks anticipated at all? You know, we've heard statements from the Iranian government. We heard them from Shiite militias here in Iraq that they are going to retaliate. They're going to retaliate with vengeance. Uh, Americans were anticipating this. But what's interesting is a few days ago, we heard from one of the Iraqi militias, Qatayat Hezbollah, that warned Iraqi soldiers around these bases to stay a kilometer away, so a little over a mile away from the U.S. military presence. Now, was that a warning that the Iranians were going to strike, or was that an another warning? That that was, though, a warning that something looked to be uh, coming down the line. So that that could be part of it, also. You know, something also that's interesting that we're hearing is this: the difference in numbers. So the Iranians are saying that tens of missiles were fired. The Americans are saying a little over a dozen. I, I was in Saudi Arabia when the Aramco oil refinery was hit, and something that we saw that the Saudis showed us was that some of these munitions that were fired were duds. They fell in the desert. They didn't make it as far. Uh, and so possibly that's one theory why these numbers aren't matching is that maybe a number of those rockets that were fired were duds that landed just in the desert. So something that they'll probably look, be looking in the desert to see if there are any that just fell short of their target. Right. All right. Well, Ian Lee, thank you so much for reporting for us from Iraq there. Thank you so much. And Natalie Brand, I want to go to you next. How is Capitol Hill reacting to the news? And we understand that several lawmakers have been briefed. Is that correct? 
That's right. The Democratic leaders were called by the vice president, that's minority leader uh, Chuck Schumer in the Senate and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Our Hill producer Rebecca Kaplan reports that Speaker Pelosi actually found out when she was handed a note during a regularly scheduled meeting, and she told members in that meeting to pray. We know that following that, she did have a conversation with the vice president. Now, minority leader on the House side, Kevin McCarthy, says he spoke spoke to the president according to an aide. We still don't exactly know what lawmakers know detail-wise about this attack. And, of course, congressional leaders here and the White House closely monitoring this very fluid situation. But across all sides, uh, the main message here is the first and immediate concern is for U.S. troops in the region and, of course, coalition partners. Natalie Brand on Capitol Hill, thank you so much. And Catherine, what more do we know about how the administration is responding? Well, we've had information from the White House this evening that the president has remained engaged and he's met with his national security team, uh, the secretary of state, his national security advisor, as well as the defense secretary. And we've heard publicly from the defense secretary and the secretary of state uh, earlier today. Uh, the defense secretary was very clear about the quality of the intelligence they had and in his view, how it pointed to an imminent or very active plot targeting U.S. interests in the region. Uh, asked how imminent it was, he said it was fair to say it was days and not weeks away. He also said, and this was new information, that General Soleimani was in Baghdad. Remember, he had been traveling regionally. He had been to Beirut. He had been to Damascus. And then he had come into Baghdad uh, very late at night into the early hours of uh, Friday. And that is when he was targeted. And Secretary Esper said that Soleimani was in Baghdad, to his words, to, quote, coordinate attacks in the area. So he was taking a very active role in this plot. And that's consistent with information we had here at CBS News from a senior U.S. government official when the strike happened last week. They said Soleimani was personally overseeing and steering an active plot against U.S. interests in the region. Uh, just as sort of a final footnote, one of the things I learned through my reporting today is that after the Soleimani strike, there was what's called in intelligence circles a spike in the chatter. And what that means is that when you have operatives who are, in this case, allied with the Iranians or General Soleimani or the militias or in Syria or in Lebanon, they get on their phones, they get on their computers, they start text messaging, they're on social media. I mean, their, their comms networks really light up, and that's what they call a spike in the chatter. And this is almost, in some ways, a real gift for intelligence analysts because it allows them to scoop up that information and start to identify new potential leads. And I just can't emphasize enough how good the U.S. military is, as well as the signals intelligence people, as well as the special operators, at identifying the source of those communications and then really latching into it and not letting go of it until they decide <coughs> it's a target or it's not a target. And when you think about that kind of language and those steps, that's really what we saw with General Soleimani last week. We were on him for several days as he traveled in the region, then he came into Baghdad, and that was the moment that the administration decided to take that strike. What I was, it was described to me as a clean shot. Wow, a clean shot. All right, mm -hmm. let's also bring in CBS News White House correspondent mm -hmm. Weijia Jang. Weijia, what's the latest you can tell us coming out of the White House? Well, we know that President Trump was huddled here in the Situation Room with his national security team along with the vice president. But so far, we have not heard from the president himself about these Iranian attacks. Because on the one hand, of course, it would take longer than just a matter of hours for him to decide his next move with his team and then announce it to uh, uh, the, the country and the world. But on the other hand, you know, they were anticipating this. Officials came out today and said they knew that Iran was probably going to retaliate in some way or another and that the U.S. would be ready to respond appropriately. Um, President Trump did say earlier today that if Iran does anything that they shouldn't be doing, they're going to be suffering the consequences and very strongly. Of course, what exactly he means right now is the answer that 
uh, everybody is waiting for, mm -hmm. because as Democrats already point out on Capitol Hill, that will determine what happens next uh, in Tehran and whether this will continue to escalate and how serious it could become. But certainly already uh, these consequences are potentially dire and uh, congressional leaders are publicly voicing their concerns about what this means. As for uh, the president, again, we are closely monitoring his Twitter feed because often that's how he announces dramatic uh, foreign policy announcements, dramatic moves that he plans to make. Nothing at all, Tanya. So I think that's a good indication mm -hmm. that they are very carefully calculating what happens next. Absolutely. It is it is anytime the uh, president is not tweeting it's uh, it's significant. We do, are Democrats likely to be consulted on the response here? I mean we know that they were very upset about not being told or consulted about the attack on Soleimani right. before it happened. Is there a chance that they will demand to have a say in how this attack is responded to? Well, you know, uh, lucky for them, they have an opportunity to voice those concerns because tomorrow the White House is set to brief uh, the full House and Senate on the Soleimani strike. And you can bet that those lawmakers will be bringing up what happens next as well. We know that House Speaker Nancy Pelosi was already planning to take a vote on a resolution to limit the president's military actions against Iran out of fear uh, of what doing something would mean uh, with regard to a potential war. And so uh, the administration has tried to tamp down those fears, the president saying many times this week alone, uh, that the world is now a safer place, that Americans are safer. But that comes at a cost, as we are seeing now. And it's too early to say how high that cost is and whether there will be other uh, strikes against uh, the U.S. as well. And so these are concerns that Democrats will be bringing to the White House, and, uh, mm -hmm. and we'll just have to see what the president decides. Right. And, uh, Catherine, what other types of responses could be possible here other than a conventional military retaliation. A concept that people talk a lot about in military circles, which is called the gray zone. And this is the battle space between peace and conventional warfare. And that's when you have in your arsenal things like cyber attacks where attribution is so difficult. So we think about a response from the United States in, in terms of what happened this evening with Iran in a very conventional way. But I would encourage people to think about it in a slightly more imaginative way, because in these scenarios, my contacts always say that stealth is your friend mm -hmm. <laughs> and that not being able to make a firm attribution to a response also is your friend. So whether it comes through the United States or whether it comes through one of our allies uh, in the regions, and as, as you know, for covering this area for a number of years, um, the U.S. and its allies have used cyber techniques to uh, really go at the heart of Iran's nuclear program in the sure. past. I mean, that's not a new that's not a new idea. So what the idea I would leave folks at home with today is to start thinking about the concept of the gray zone. Again, it's that mm -hmm. battle space between peace and conventional warfare. Uh, and unfortunately, it's a battle space where um, nation states are sort of on a level playing field uh, with bad actors because of issues issues of attribution, the use of cyber and, right. and and the like. But, you know, stealth is your friend in a situation like this. And uh, I don't want to read too much into what we've the lack of information that we've had from the White House about the casualties and the scope um, of the damage. But again, stealth and a little bit of mystery right. uh, is a friend in your situation in this situation. I'm sure, we all remember mm -hmm. Stuxnet and, uh, you know, that cyber attack, which resulted actually in physical explosions in, uh, you know, within but the. That, if, I, if I could, that raises, though, a whole sort of host of a sort of larger ethical sure. um, issues. Like when does a cyber attack really cross the line to become an act of war? And part of that discussion has been, does a cyber attack just wipe systems of data or 
in the case of Iran's nuclear program when it causes physical damage to the structure of an operation. Does right. that, or like Sony here in the United States, is that actually an act of war? So cyber is appealing in many ways, but it also raises a whole host of ethical questions as to where you cross the line uh, into an unconventional attack to an act of war. Absolutely. All right, mm -hmm. Catherine Harridge, thank you so much. Let's bring in now CBS News national security correspondent David Martin. An off-camera briefing with the Pentagon spokesperson just <clears throat> wrapped up. David, what did you learn? Well, um, I have to tell you that the, uh, <clears throat> the backgrounder uh, from this defense official was uh, <clears throat> very uninformative. It didn't uh, really uh, tell us any more uh, about what happened tonight uh, than we already knew. It uh, certainly did not tell us uh, that uh, what the damage done by these missiles was, if any. Mm -hmm. uh, that is something we are not likely to uh, find out about until uh, tomorrow morning. Um, we did uh, get some more information on what <clears throat> Defense Secretary Esper was uh, doing, doing this afternoon and this evening. Um, both he and General Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, were here in the Pentagon when the attack occurred, um, and then uh, went to the White House to uh, to brief the president, and then came back, uh, and uh, they have had a number of um, meetings that the uh, entire Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, met with the Secretary of Defense, uh, the uh, Secretary of Defense, and other officials in this building made calls to uh, all of uh, the uh, regional allies, uh, those, those would be the Arab uh, countries in the region, and to all the uh, traditional NATO allies of the U.S. to give them <clears throat> a briefing on what happened. Uh, and then, of course, there's the, uh, the question that everybody wants an answer to, what will be the uh, American response to this attack? And uh, the answer to that was, I'm not going to forecast any response. Mm -hmm. So uh, other than the <clears throat> whereabouts and the actions of uh, the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, this backgrounder from a defense official did not really add anything to what we knew. All right. David Martin at the Pentagon, thank you so much for that update. Sure thing. Let's bring back in Natalie Brand on Capitol Hill. Natalie, you're getting some more information on lawmaker reaction. Tanya, reaction is beginning to trickle in across the lawmakers still on the Capitol and speaking before cameras tonight. So let me read you some of what the House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman Elliot Engel, Democrat of New York, said. He, of course, the first concern is with U.S. troops and prayers that there were no casualties. This is a very fluid situation. We don't know what lawmakers know at this point. Uh, but really, he said that we need to know more about a strategy. And there's a lot of concern that this could spiral out of control very, very quickly. Uh, this is something that Democratic lawmakers on the Hill have been calling for in the days since the U.S. strike targeting Iranian General Soleimani, what is the strategy moving forward to try to de-escalate the situation? And around the time, or I guess in the hours before we heard uh, about this attack, uh, keep in mind that congressional leaders were being briefed, the so-called Gang of Eight congressional leaders and also the leaders of the intelligence committees were receiving a briefing about the intelligence leading up to a strike. And then a couple of hours later, um, we heard about this new attack. So obviously there's still a lot of questions. We've also heard from some Republican lawmakers who are echoing some of the statements that have come from top administration officials that the U.S. is not seeking war with Iran, but what happens next really is up to them. Uh, Senator Kennedy, Republican from Louisiana, said we don't want war. All we want it's very simple what we want. Stop trying to kill us. So at this point, obviously, a very fluid situation. Uh, and as lawmakers learn more, they will likely say more. But the big question here on the Hill 
is what mm -hmm. is the strategy going forward? How do you uh, de-escalate this situation? That's something that lawmakers uh, will be talking about in the coming hours and days. Natalie Brand, Catherine Herridge, and Weijia Jiang, thanks to all of you. We're going to take a quick break now. We'll be right back with much more CBSN. Thanks. Stay with us.